Jones, Maria Royal, for the Legislative Council. So I am going to be walking through S193 with you today. Uh, and this is a bill that relates to some rules that you authorized last year as part of the broadband bill at 79, specifically section 25. We asked the E911 board um, to adopt rules that establish protocols for the reporting of outages, um, system outages that are applicable to wireless service providers and VoIP providers and electric companies. Uh, so the 911 board uh, did adopt those rules which have been filed with LCAR, and I believe they're on the agenda for later this month. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of that background because in the bill itself, um, you'll see on page two, subsection D, it says that a person who violates a provision of a board rule establishing outage reporting protocols shall be subject to an administrative penalty of $25,000 for each day of non-compliance and proceeded against as provided under the APA. As used in this subsection, person means an originating carrier that provides voice service as defined by board rule. So this is, an, is essentially a penalty provision that's applicable to these new board rules um, recently filed with LCAR, and I believe you're gonna hear more about those rules. Okay. And, and so the rules, what are the rules aiming to do? Uh, so, so based on the charge and the rules themselves, the idea is that the, these outages that would affect Protocol. wireless service, VoIP service, and electric companies uh, that might impact 911 availability, and the report goes to the 911 board. Um, and you know this issue came up uh, in relation to you know VoIP providers that might lose electricity, um, and this therefore the you don't have your traditional phone line that could yeah. still be working in a power right. outage. And so, in order for there to be a kind of this was the if your internet went down, if no one told you you had to replace the batteries on your phone periodically. When your power went out, you didn't have the ability to call 911. Is that, I know we addressed that's, that issue. Yeah, that's you, what brought this you on. You addressed that issue in two places. One, it's, a, it's addressed here to ensure that 911 is aware of the outages, that the outages and where there might be potential disruption of 911 service. That was fine. There's also an open investigation, which uh, you, I don't remember the deadline, that has to do with those backup power requirements and making sure that Vermont consumers yeah. are aware of what they are. So that's a, yes, a separate it's matter. The Shrewsbury. 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 Yeah. That um, no one had ever told them. They couldn't, they called the, the, the cable provider. They didn't. So it was one, one place in Vermont where you could get the battery and they were out of them. They were out of them. Yes, I remember that. We, we, we had adopted this, this uh, provision so as to try to get a handle on how often is there such a problem because nobody had any idea. We talked to the Iron One, one board, nobody had an idea. How, much, how many times are Vermonters unable to dial 911 because of a power outage, a power down, whatever the case may be? And so the goal was uh, to get something in place. Now, I gather that what, what's happened is some of the carriers, the larger carriers, uh, uh, were having difficulty because what we wanted them to do was if there was, uh, if, if, if they were capturing the information in some systems, such as the ones that they had to do periodic reporting to the federal government, rather than to impose something that required everybody to jump through great hoops is capture what you can. And so we modified it a, a couple of times while it was still in progress. Mm -hmm. And I gather that over the summer, uh, the E911 board has been talking to the various carriers 
Uh, and that there are still some issues in terms of how you capture the data and whether or not the data that's being captured uh, for the, uh, the feds is, is sufficiently granular to meet our purposes. Okay. And I, I, so that's what this is all about by way of background. Okay, and, but this bill essentially just adds a penalty for not reporting and a pretty stiff penalty. Compliant with stiff the penalty. rules. Yeah, okay. Once but they're not, in. not a penalty for being out. No. 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 A penalty. Yeah. For not reporting. They've given the potential we could have an ice storm today. Um, no one controls that. All right. So is, is it commonplace to put administrative penalties in the statute, or is it sometimes put in the rules themselves? Uh, it, it can be either. If there isn't a penalty provided or, or one authorized, you can certainly put it in statute. You can do either. You could have put it in the rule specified that there will be administrative penalties and yeah. even suggested now. This, could this rule have put the penalties in the rule? Was there authority to do penalties within the statute? Uh, so the 911 board has rulemaking authority uh, and has, I don't know if it has authority, I'm going to have to look to see if it has authority to impose fines for violations of its existing rules. That, if it does, then the board could have put them in here. I, I just have to check. Mm -hmm. sure. And maybe Bar Barbara's meal is scheduled to be next, so she might know <coughs> since she does it every day. Okay. So that's our, that's a simple one to walk through compared to insurance yesterday. <laughs> yeah. This part uh, was simple. Yeah. <laughs> I think this one may cause a little more controversy, though, than the insurance bill yesterday. Okay, right. Barbara, come on up. Good. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Do you want me to address my thoughts on S-193, or are we talking now about the rule itself? Let's talk uh, about both. Okay. I've got you s sitting here talking about the rules. Um, well, why don't we start with 193, and then we'll talk about the rule. That might... Okay. I'm going to trust Faith. Okay. Set this up for a reason. Okay. <laughs> so, for the record, I'm Barbara Neal, Executive Director of the Enhanced 911 Board. And on S-193 specifically, um, the board really does not have an opinion one way or the other about um, the penalty or the amount of the penalty. Uh, whatever is deemed to be appropriate is something that we will work with. Uh, we had consulted, I believe we do have the authority to put a penalty uh, into our rules, but I will appreciate Maria's double check of the statute to confirm that. Uh, but as we were developing the rule, <clears throat> we did so in consultation with our legal counsel and came to the conclusion that the, uh, the general uh, remedy that we have, which is to go to Washington County Superior Court, would be effective. And when this, when S-193, when I became aware of it, um, it made me think back on the 20 years of reporting that we have required from Vermont's regulated wireline, that's a traditional wireline telephone service. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and I could think of uh, maybe a few instances where we had to go to the, the telephone service provider and say, we're aware of your report, we're, uh, we're aware of an issue here. Where is, <coughs> excuse me, where is your report? Um, and when we've had to make those calls, typically, uh, the, the instances that I'm remembering, the, re the outage report was produced within a matter of hours, not days. Um, so I would say, historically, there has not been any um, significant issue that, that would have caused me to consider. To say you needed a very strict penalty right. because right. in general, they've been very compliant. They have. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about the regulated wireline oh, telephone service right. providers. So, um, however, if uh, the, the committee or the legislature deems that it's appropriate, we'll certainly implement, um, we'll implement that and include it in our, our toolbox. So, when you get notified, pardon me? When you get notified, 
does that change your behavior? I mean, what can you do if you know the electric's out, if you know the cable's out? The, do you have a remedy? I know last time we talked about having a duplicity of, you know, a, a workaround. I mean, is there something you can do? When we, ha when we get a report from a telephone service provider, and this would be the regulated telephone service providers right, right now, um, we, uh, we evaluate that report, then we also notify our public safety answering points where 911 calls are answered. Okay. Uh, so for situational awareness purposes, really, so that they are aware that there's a community that they answer 911 calls for that may have certain um, telephone customers who, are, who don't have service. Yes. All right. um, they, in turn, have been asked, the PSEPs have been asked to notify the local responders, and in some cases, the local responders may have particular protocols that they implement in those cases. Uh, we don't know the specifics of each and every um, protocol at the local level, uh, and nor do we have purview over it. Um, so, but it's really a matter uh, for us of situational awareness and um, passing the information along to those who can or might be okay. able to use but, it, or at least should be aware. But I'm still going to pick up my phone and not be able to call it. Now, Potentially, yes. Here, I'm in the big city. Uh, no, my phone's not working. My phone's not working. So I can't call. Mm -hmm. Cause what was, I couldn't call without outside my service area. So that, that is the issue of isolation, which we spent a lot of time yes, talking about. Year. And isolation is a particular kind of telephone service outage. It, it's kind of a subset of the, uh, okay. the outage reporting that we get now. That's um, the, the isolation that we have been discussing is related to host remote isolation in a wireline network. And it's a situation where the caller still has dial tone but they can't call outside their That's local exchange, the really is the easiest right. way to describe it, or off network. So, so I'm in the big city, I can call my local fire police department. You could, potentially. But if I'm out in one of those more rural towns where my local fire police ambulance, they usually right. all in the same building. Mm -hmm. um, services, I might not, if I call 911, I can't get through, and if I call the fire department. That you may not have a fire department or, or a, a dispatch center that's manned 24 hours, four a, hours day. a day. We that's win right. that exchange. But even if, um, Barry Town services pretty much their ambulance, pretty much the whole area. Mm -hmm. If I live in Barry Town, I can probably call the ambulance. If I live out in Callis or Wood, I don't know if they go as far as Woodbury, but I'm pretty sure they go as far as Callis. Right. If I, I don't know that that 911 call is, no one picks up though. So right. I know no. Uh, I can't get through. Right. That's the, that's the experience that yeah. happens with a host remote isolation. Right. If there's okay. no 24-hour uh, number so, within that, if there is, and nothing here changes that. All it's, nothing here. Where in the rule? No. We we'll, we'll go on. I've I've got one more witness on the penalty. Okay. And then we'll go on to the rules. And I've got a question about having had a disturbing experience with not having an address. Okay. Only a very obvious, it was within sight of the ambulance. Mm -hmm. um, and it took, it seemed like forever, but was probably 15 to 20 minutes to get the dispatcher to dispatch the ambulance. So I would need to know the details of yeah, that, and then I, I would be to happy to look into it. Yes. Because I'm sure that there are cases in an emergency where you don't know the address. You well, don't yeah. know the mile marker on the mm -hmm. interstate, um, and just how what the workaround is for that. 
Well, there are a number of tools and resources that are available to the call takers uh, okay. in every piece of. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. I wanted to talk about that because it was upsetting. Certainly. Okay. Seems like there were really two instances that brought this discussion to a head last year. Uh, the first was the isolation uh, situation, and it's in particular in, related to Alberg in Grand Isle. That's right. In which there were two instances in which, uh, two separate instances in which there were emergencies, and they attempted to call 911, and as a result of an isolation problem, they were not able to do so. So that was item one. The second, uh, in particular, was the Shrewsbury incident, mm -hmm. in which a, an entire town uh, lost their phone service for at least, as I recall, two weeks or more uh, with, again, no one having a handle on the reporting of the entirety of the problem. And so what I believe we were trying to do with this, this particular underlying request in which this penalty applies was just get a handle on how big a problem is this because nobody seemed to know. And so this is kind of an interim step of reporting to figure out how big a problem do we have uh, while we then try to figure out, well, what, if anything, are we able to do about it? Yeah, and I think it may just be those two instances. We don't know. We don't well, know. Well, okay. we, well, we have had reports of isolation Absolutely. events. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think there were two, or there were two or four. I can't remember the mm -hmm. exact number in each of the years 2017 and 2018. Um, so they are not frequent, but they do occur, and obviously, it's not a not an ideal situation. So we do know to some extent when those isolation, those particular isolation events occur in a wireline network because mm -hmm. we get reports from the wireline company. But you get nothing from the wireless. We, we, we do when it reaches a certain, certain threshold at the mm -hmm. FCC. Our, the rule that we wrote was meant to address um, defining thresholds that mm -hmm. we thought would meet the legislative <coughs> intent of Section 25 of Act 79 uh, and perhaps be more <coughs> appropriate for Vermont and align with the reports that we've been getting for the wireline from the wireline companies for 20 years. And I am happy to talk about that when that when the okay. time comes. I, I, yeah, I, I, I have uh, I have handouts. Ah, you have a copy of the rule. <laughs> <laughs> so the first the first is the, the packet of the filing, the actual all of the documents that went with the filing to the Secretary of State's office and LCAR. I it's, I don't expect you to read it, but or to read it right now, obviously. But I might refer to sections of it. So if you take a look at that document, you'll see in the upper right hand corner there's some numbering in red. So when we need to turn to certain pages, if we do, okay. I'll be referring to those. This document is just the rule. You'll be happy to know it's much shorter. I, this is the packet I get in the mail. Right. When the rule book. Are you on <clears throat> No, but the committee chairs of jurisdiction get a packet, and this is a small one. Some of them have been huge. So um, going through the the rule itself, you want me to go section by section? Is that how this is done? Seems like a summary. I think that's what this means. Mm -hmm. The way section by section deals with what it is that's accomplished or should yep. just the purpose section. Well, I think the purpose section will tell you. It really, what, we're, what we meant to do here is to establish the protocols for outage reporting for certain originating carriers uh, as defined in section 25 of that 79, which was the wireless and the fixed non-line powered services, which are your VoIP services. We also incorporated into this those existing rules for wireline companies that I referenced earlier, so okay, that we would so have now one have rule. One rule that. Yep. For for outage notifications from originating carriers. And the purpose, as you'll recall, of, of Section 25 was to create these protocols so we would have the data to make an assessment of how these various outages impact the ability of Vermonters to reach 911. So a data gathering mechanism. Um, section 3 goes through all of the definitions of the various um, 
types of originating carriers, uh, what, a, what an outage is for an originating carrier, a wireless carrier, and an electric power outage. We define voice service. Um, section 4 says that all facilities-based fixed voice service originating carriers, so facilities-based fixed voice service would be uh, wireline and VoIP, not wireless. Those companies are expected, in the rule, it requires that they report an outage to us when 25 or more of their subscribers are unable to complete calls to or communicate with 911 and that and that situation lasts for 30 minutes or more. And then it lists the information that we, we want to see in those reports, uh, requires them to notify us when service is restored. Section 4.2 outlines the requirements, and they're a little bit different for wireless service uh, providers. Um, they, if they have an outage that meets the definition in, the, in Section 3, um, they are to notify us, uh, and last 30 minutes or more, they're to notify us of that outage. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. I have a question. Can I ask why um, the cutoff is, is 25 subscribers or more? Why does it start there? Um, it starts there because that's what we've historically gathered from the regulated wireline companies. So um, that threshold was in place. Um, it's been in place for a long time. I don't know where exactly it originated or when. Does um, anyone do less than 25 subscribers? I'm, there may have been in the olden days when we were cranking up phones, very small, local. But well, well you, could have, you could have an outage that impacts fewer than 25 customers. Out. Yeah, but then they do not need to report that. Right. But you could have an outage involving a single apartment building in Burlington that has more than 25 right. subscribers. Oh, yeah. Right. Sure, you could. So then, you know, a telephone call, you know, a telephone wire could break in a storm involving one building, and then you have a reporting requirement. Right. So what, what year did you witness say that the 25 20 threshold was established? Human when was it established? Uh, I would have to go back into the Just historical. Don I, I would say early 2000s. That's a that's a guess. We uh, went online in 1998. It was 20 years ago when we first. We've been receiving. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We've been receiving reports from wireline companies for 20 years. And so, uh, just to clarify, so then we we don't have any requirements for reporting when there's an outage under 25. Subscribers, not to the 911 board. Okay. Um, I would uh, encourage you to talk to the public service department to see if there are certain requirements for, or maybe some of the uh, folks here now know, if there are certain requirements for reporting, like uh, how quickly they repair um, outages, uh, not outages, but interruptions to individuals, and whether or not that would <coughs> meet what what you're asking about. The 911 board does not have those requirements. Well, there's also the issue of wireless carriers. There, there's no reporting currently, uh, other than what, what we're doing here. There is right? no um, rule in the state of Vermont for reporting specific to wireless and what, or VoIP. And, yeah, and what is I understand that you're trying to do is you're trying to get a uniformity uh, of rules. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess the question that comes to my mind is that wireless uh, carriers are different than regulated wire carriers. In other words, uh, if you have a particular outage from a wireless uh, provider, is it more likely that a larger number of people would be involved for that single incident or that single problem than would be the case with a hardwire carrier? So the numbers may be very different. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. It would depend entirely on, on what caused the outage and, and where it happened. Um, I think it might be helpful if, if I went through kind of how we came to the thresholds that we defined. It speaks a little bit to the 25 level, but kind of in the opposite direction. You know, why are we not satisfied? Uh, let me back up a little bit. Many of the, um, the national carriers, wireless and VoIP, have um, given us uh, lots of input and public and comment on um, 
their recommendation that we accept the FCC defined thresholds for outage reporting. Um, we did not accept those in our, or we did not implement those in our rule. We, ex we implemented much, much astronomically lower uh, thresholds for okay. reporting because we thought it meant, met the intent of the legislature and it better serves Vermont. So, um, so we know that Section 25 originated uh, from a number of sources, which you just reviewed, the isolation events and also the, the um, concerns that were um, stated by many citizens in Southern Vermont News there is one town. And so um, as we developed the rule, we looked first to the existing outage re reporting requirements for the wireline companies. And that mean, those companies are required to report 25 or more of their subscribers out of service within two hours of that event, and then let us know when the service has been restored. And as I mentioned before, that information is passed on to our public safety answering points for situational awareness purposes. There are no specific rules in Vermont right now for wireless and VoIP. I will note, though, that when we start talking about FCC thresholds, the regulated wireline customer or companies that are reporting to us at 25 or more customers also have to report to the FCC when they meet the FCC defined threshold. So they are uh, bound by that as well. Um, Can I ask here's a basic question. Yeah, about? sure. Um, is there a difference between an outage to connect to E911 and just a general outage? Uh, what our rule requires is reporting if the, the ability of the caller to reach 911 is impacted. I understand that. Is there any, does that ever happen when you have a general outage as well? I think that you could have, we've gotten reports that, um, yes, I think it can happen that way. Okay. I'm not going to be able to give you a specific mm -hmm. example. I know that there are times when we will receive, like, of the voice part of a call, but not the Annie and Allie, not the um, data that comes along with the call. Okay. So that's a 911 impacting um, situation. Um, I would have to research, I guess, to know if, if there was ever a time where you couldn't reach 911, but you could call. I think you can. Subscriber to subscriber might be able to call, but they might not be able to get outside their network. Actually, Isolation is kind of an example of that as well, now that I'm mm -hmm. processing this through, sorry. Um, so, yes, there are situations where you have no access to 911, but you may have dial tone and the ability to reach certain other places. Um, so, uh, he here's why we don't think that the FCC thresholds um, meet what you intended in this Section 25. In the simplest of terms, these carriers, the, and we're talking about the wireless and the, and the VoIP companies, are required to report to the FCC any outage that impacts 900,000 user minutes. So 900,000 user minutes means 900,000 subscribers are out of service for one minute, or 100,000 subscribers are out of service for nine minutes, but to get this down to kind of Vermont numbers, it means 30,000 subscribers are out for 30 minutes, 10,000 for 90 minutes, and so on and so on. And so to get to the 25 users that we're currently getting reports on, they would have to be out for 36,000 minutes or 600 hours, which is like more than three weeks. So, bottom line is we would not know about those. I, I would say you would know by yeah. <laughs> Well, we would, or we would not know that, that this had been out of, out of service for that. We wouldn't get a phone call from them. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> Somebody would. Yeah. So, so a more, um, yeah. if you go to a more um, maybe commonplace event, let's say that there's a thousand sub subscribers of some service that lose their telephone service. That service would have to be out for 15 hours to meet that 900,000 user minute threshold. So we would not, if we accepted the FCC thresholds as appropriate for Vermont, we would not know about that 
for 15 or potentially 17 hours because they have two hours to report it. And that's probably a large <laughs> number of um, towns, definitely the more isolated towns. Right, so if we go back to Shrewsbury, yeah. there's about a thousand people, I believe, that live in Shrewsbury. Now, not every person has a phone there, right? right? But so we looked in the 911 data, and there's about 650 uh, sites there, so that aren't outbuildings. So their residences are business, and they would likely have a telephone. I can't really do that math. So let's say yeah, 500, right. it would be 30 hours before they would meet that 900,000 hour, a uh, user minute rather, 900,000 user minute yeah. threshold. Um, given that the, the kind of the genesis of this section 25 was concerns like that, accepting that threshold just didn't make sense to us. Um, well, that threshold is there, so if that threshold's okay, we don't need to do rules. Because well, what I think what I'm saying, or I know what I'm saying yeah. to you, is that that threshold is not necessarily okay. Right, for no, I, think, I yeah. think that's not, yeah, I mean, we would need to do nothing if that were okay, but I think that means <coughs> that a significant number of communities in Vermont would have to be out of service for a significant amount, a lot of people can have heart attacks in 30 hours. Right. Um, so just to clarify, because there's there's a bunch of different, well, there's actually, I think, three different technologies that we're talking about here, right? Wireline, we're talking about the non-line powered, uh, like VoIP service, and wireless. So as this relates to wireless, they are also at that 900,000 user minute threshold, and the SEC has a calculation that these carriers use to determine how do we figure how many users are on a tower at any given time. Um, and so that calculation is run through, it varies for, uh, for different companies based on how many customers they have nationwide or worldwide or, or some calculation. Uh, but to, to use the figure 1,000 user minutes per wireless tower is a generally accepted as a good estimation. So the same would apply. We would have one tower down for, it would have to be 15 hours before it became reportable under the SCC thresholds. In some towns, that might be okay because maybe there's overlapping coverage. And if there is overlapping coverage, those other carriers, if they're technologically compatible, will be able to send the 911 call on. That's fine. However, there's a lot of towns, and I don't have hard and fast data on this, but I think that we can all agree that it is not unusual for uh, a uh, single town or portion of a town or community to be served by one tower. And when that one tower goes down, they have no wireless service. We're still dealing with towns that have no wireless. Correct. Or, well, correct. And we're not even that. This is if the tower is there. This, right. um, Hopefully they post. have landlines if they have no right. tower. Correct. Right. So, so, so that's why um, you know, the, the argument has been made or the comments have been made that the FCC has established these thres thresholds and they did consider whether or not it was appropriate for rural um, co communities, states, uh, to have these thresholds. And they determined that it was. But I would counter, or I would add, that they determined that it was appropriate for the purposes that they are gathering the data, right. not necessarily for what we are gathering the yeah. data. I mean, they need to know when the national emergency or half the New England is blacked out, and that's one thing. Yeah. We're interested in getting emergency services to people before something worse happens to them. And, and, and our role in that is to ensure that the notification about the outage gets to the public safety answering points and then ultimately to emergency managers or emergency management. We're working on new protocols, by the way, to ensure that emergency management is, is aware uh, in a more formal way than they have been in the past, in the past. on these outages. So, um, 
Wait, we've got one more question. Right. Madam Chair, um, a couple decades ago we had set a 25 person threshold so mm -hmm. for notification. Is there any preemption in the federal government on our ability to change that number? No, that, that was a okay. number 25 years ago. Since we can, after 20 years of experience, um, are you ready to make a recommendation that, that that number should be changed and to what, what number would you make as a recommendation? The rule outlines that, that we believe that the wireless company, these national companies should be reporting at the more granular 25 subscriber or something of an equivalent, depending on the technology level. So, so what would you recommend? I would recommend leaving the reporting at, at the 20, at that one range. Would you recommend lowering the 25? From 25? To um, whatever. You know, my, my understanding of how that came about was, you know, we wanted to be hearing about in, instances where uh, there was a public safety uh, concern on, on more of a community-wide basis. My, my, my question is, I, I understand what you first did. You did mm -hmm. for the reasons you mm -hmm. did. 20 years later, when you have a chance to take a look at it, mm -hmm. review it, would you recommend that it be changed? No, I'd recommend it stay the same. Not raised, not lowered, stay the same. Right. Thank you. When you were in your various discussions with the larger carriers, did you find that they had the ability to provide you with the information you needed? And if not, what were the impediments? Well, they, they did describe that there would be some technological um, changes and IT changes that they would have to make in order to meet these reporting thresholds. I don't have specifics on what those are. Uh, they expressed that those would cost money for, for them to do. Again, I, I asked, but we don't have specifics on that, but I, I'm sure that they are um, willing and able to let you know what those um, yeah, obstacles I, might be. They will. Um, uh, one thing I'll, I will note is um, there have been occasions, of course, where we become aware of an outage, let's say, in a, in a wireless carrier's um, network here in Vermont, and we will make a call, the 911 board IT staff will make a call to their technical people, their NOC, their what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and we have always been able to get the information that we need from them in that kind of real-time conversation. Um, so I think that the information is there. It's a matter of them needing to develop whatever they need to develop to uh, mine that information and get it out to us in a proactive way instead of us calling and saying this is going on, can you give us any information? So, because you're basically only going to know when someone can't get through and they call someone else or trot over to the neighbor with a landline and say, I can't get through, can you dial 911 or can I use your phone? Right. And I think of one thing that hasn't really been brought into the conversation, so I'll do it now, is um, you know, we talk about the impact of outages on uh, the regular uh, public um, the, who need access to 911, and that's obviously a very critical piece. But there are also responders out there who are using these telephone services, mm -hmm. uh, wireless, uh, wireline, and all the various services. Um, police departments, response agencies, dispatch agencies who are reliant upon the various different services, uh, which is another reason why I would recommend keeping that threshold low um, so that as we're doing those notifications, um, when we receive a report, those entities have an opportunity to be aware of it as well. You might not know that you EMT might not be getting the call to show up to answer the response. I mean, uh, it certainly it creates all kinds ambulance. of potential communications okay. concerns. Yeah. Could you, um, the way I read the language in section three, you have no options as to whether to impose the administrative penalties or not. On S on on one ninety three. Yeah, it it, it 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 doesn't even say up to. It it's up to pretty hard. Doesn't give you any discretion to like if it's the first time or if there was a mitigating circumstance. Is that the way you want it? Or do you have to impose that there's a violation of the rule? Well, I would I would just comment that this is not something that we um, asked for, but when we became aware that that it was there. 
um, we don't uh, necessarily oppose the idea. Um, as I read it, though, it says shall be subject to an administrative penalty. So I would need to check with my legal counsel to know, does that afford me any flexibility? I, I would say the plain reading says no. We shall be subject the, to. Uh, the proposer yeah. come over and tell us his intent. But normally, you get things about may and up to. Up to, right. Yeah. And because there could be mitigating circumstances like They've got a lineman down under a tip truck and they're working at getting their lineman out and that's where their focus is Certainly. at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, or in a major crisis, they're dealing with the crisis and not with your crisis. So right, and I think- Up to would be- Up to in May, I think. I think right. one thing kind of speaks to that is is the focus should be, and the 911 board agrees with this, the, the focus should be on restoring service. Yes. Even uh, as it relates to notifications to us. So we say in the rule, tell us about the outage if it meets these thresholds within two hours of your discovery of it or as soon as reasonably possible. So it is not our intent to slow down the restoration of service that needs to be we agree the first priority um, and so having said i think um, i would not disagree that having that same approach in the penalty might be an appropriate thing to consider okay All right. other When you're supposed to rest that out, I want you to look at that section. It's two hours or what, where is that? That is in, uh, you go to section 4, 4.1. Right. So um, that first section there, uh, it reports any known outage lasting more than 30 minutes that limits or prevents 25 or more subscribers from completing calls to or communicating with 911. The OC, that means originating carrier, shall notify the 911 system provider and the board within two hours of discovery of each occurrence or as soon as reasonably possible. So is the intent there whichever is sooner or is it essentially as soon as reasonably possible? I think we need, I think that we we need to uh, we need to let the companies perhaps determine in individual circumstances what is reasonable reasonably possible given that we want them to fix the problem we want their first priority to be to fix so the problem the intent there is to, to could be a day under that circumstance well, I'm not sure. It depends on the circumstance, that okay, that would be reasonably, okay. yeah, yeah. If, they, if it's a day and there's just we didn't get to it, then you've got a $25,000 fine. Right. But if there oh, is see, a yeah, major right, yeah. blizzard or ice storm and their core facility has no power and no phone service, then they may be physically unable, along with the rest of us, to notify anybody of anything. And in this day of strange weather, I don't, I don't know who had what coverage during Irene, um, or for how long major carriers were down. But I think we want them putting the bulk of their effort into getting communications back up. Well, we, we do, but we, we also want to keep in mind that public safety piece of we want right. people to I'm be notified. Out. So there's a balance here, and I can tell you from historically, from, from this 20 years of collecting the information from the wireline companies, I think the wording is the same in, in the existing, you know, or as soon as reasonably possible. And we have not, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, not had... Um, event after event after event that's not being reported in a, in a in the expected amount of time so it's not been a problem historically i mean there's been incidents where, where we've had to go out and, and get the information uh, but but it's not an everyday occurrence okay. and the purpose so. of this right now since other than notifying people that the phone service is down 
he's trying to just understand how often, right. how many people, how big a problem is this. Right. Um, right. So we plan to take this data and, and uh, analyze the data, get the data also from the electric power companies. And I should mention they have a different reporting mechanism in here. They, they are going to be reporting to us on outages lasting um, a certain amount of time monthly, not on a real-time basis. And I just want to say why we did that. Okay, because we did the law last year. I remember telling them to report so that you knew then that folks relying on VoIP might, if right. they didn't know about batteries or couldn't get them. And we should be getting those reports now from the voice from the VoIP telephone service provider okay. under this rule. Uh, but one of the things that we are going to be doing is when we receive these reports, we will check the publicly available outage reporting map to see if it looks like an electric comp electric outage might be involved here. And then when the official data comes in from the electric power company on a monthly basis, we'll analyze it after the fact to see if, if it lined up with the information we had at the time. The reason for that is, I, I know there was a lot of focus on the battery backup issue in, in Shrewsbury and other towns, yes. and, and I understand the concern. But the 911 board does not see a direct correlation between a power outage and the loss of access to 911. So, because there's so many variables in, involved. These non-line power telephone service providers are required by the FCC to make backup battery options available to their customers, so those customers may have purchased that. And if that has happened, this electric outage has no impact on their ability to reach 911. They also may have their own uh, generator in their, in, their <coughs> phone, in their phone, in their home uh, to, to keep uh, telephone service and other service working. So because of that, we, we didn't see the direct correlation, whereas when you lose your telephone service, when something happens and it's gone, that does impact your, your ability to call 911, but that should be uh, covered in the rules for originating carriers. And then we'll take the information from the electric companies after the fact and analyze it against the outage reports that we've been receiving. Okay. If we need to adjust that, um, we can, but it seemed like a reasonable place to start given all of that. Okay. Any other question at this point? Okay. Okay. Stay, hang, hang in there with us. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to go to Benjamin Aaron. Now you can talk about everything. Thank you. And I, yeah, I got that. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, honorable members, um, my name is Ben Aaron. I uh, work for CTIA. Uh, CTIA is the trade association for the wireless industry. Uh, we represent uh, carriers such as AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, U.S. Cellular, uh, Sprint, uh, handset manufacturers, uh, uh, Samsung, Apple, HTC, LG, uh, chip makers like Intel, uh, software companies, app providers. If it's part of the mobile ecosystem, we have members of the association that uh, are interested in it. Um, I'm here today in opposition to Senate Bill 193, as well as to urge for uh, some amendments to uh, the rules that Executive Director Neal just uh, presented. Um, let me start with uh, S193. Senate Bill 193 proposes to uh, apply a $25,000 fine for violations of a novel set of rules that are in effect, not, not in effect today, haven't been adopted yet, and they're also novel insofar as they're not in effect anywhere else in the nation. These are Vermont-specific rules that are not tried, no one has any idea if these are going to work. Um, so with that background, it seems to be an excessively punitive approach to immediately move to impose a $25,000 penalty for violations. Not only has there not been any, but there's no way to know if they, A, can be complied with, or B, um, uh, if there will be scoff laws. Um, I would suspect not. Um, there's also a proven alternative, and I'm going to talk about that, but I, I want to urge one point, um, and that is that Executive Director Neal's 
job uh, is to address issues regarding the E911 system for Vermont. One of the responsibilities of the legislature is to look at a little bit of a bigger picture. And one of the things I ask you to consider is whether imposing these very stringent rules that are novel, not in effect anywhere else in the nation, makes it an unattractive proposition to continue to invest in Vermont, to continue to deploy wireless networks further into Vermont, and whether those are good results for Vermont, and whether there are less stringent alternatives that might be considered and might solve, uh, might meet the requirements or the desires of the 911 board, uh, and comply with the requirements of Act 79, uh, which was the act from last year that kicked off uh, the requirement for there to be rules through, from the 911 department. Um, so uh, I'll also pause there to thank Executive Director Neal. Um, this was a very open process at the E911 department. Uh, we expressed a lot of opinions. Uh, Executive Director Neal was a very good sport about meeting with us and talking through a lot of these issues. We have talked her ear off. Uh, we're not at a point where we want to be, uh, but that's not because she didn't listen. So we really do thank her. Uh, we appreciate uh, the dialogue, um, but there's still work to do. Um, Executive Director Neal's uh, understanding of the NOR system, that's the Network Outage Reporting System, that's the Federal Outage Reporting System, uh, is, I would say, at best misleading. The standard for reporting an outage in Vermont, a single tower outage was the, the example that was given. A single tower out in the most rural part of Vermont, the most rural tower in Vermont, will be reported at the exact same time interval as a single tower outage in Boston, in Providence, in Manchester, in Concord, here in Montpelier, anywhere in the nation. A single tower outage, same time interval, anywhere in the nation. And why is that? There's a calculus, it's not really all that important to go into it, but there is a calculus as to how you figure out your expected user minutes. And the FCC decided that the fair approach would be to spread this out so that rural uh, states like Vermont and rural towers get the benefit of adding on user minutes that would be uh, you know, focused in city centers where you would expect more traffic so that you have a reporting interval that's common across the nation. Now, another thing that Executive Director Neal is probably not aware of is that single tower outages are actually fairly rare. When you have a, an issue that knocks a tower out, more often than not, it knocks a lot of towers out. Mm -hmm. If you have a single tower out, you might have an equipment issue at the tower, you might have a line that's down somewhere. These are small issues that affect single towers, but they're not all that common. The more common issue is to have a big network impact that happens somewhere at a switching center, a large trunk was lost, somebody didn't call before they digged, uh, not in your yard, but you know, in, in, on a state road or something and cuts a big data pipe. And that big data pipe takes down a lot of our towers. That's the more common type of scenario. Or you, you simply have an issue at a switching center. Um, one of the things that this avoids, this approach of having an averaged out number that tends not to report single tower outages, the approach that direct, Executive Director Neal wants to take, the 911 department wants to take, is that I will have a half hour of downtime. I now have triggered the requirement to report. If this is a single tower outage, maybe I have a bad power supply that's hooked up at the site, and I have a two hour window to report. It might take me an hour and 15 minutes to fix this, but I already have to report about an out outage that in all likelihood has already been taken care of. Single tower outages are not rarities, but they're not as uh, common as you might think, and they're fairly easy to restore usually. Um, She's not wrong, I don't want to mischaracterize this, she's not wrong that a single tower outage will take a while to become a reportable event. But having said that, it, it's again, not the norm. And it, it's not true that it's reported differently for rural towers than it would be for urban towers. It's reported the same way, same time interval. Um, what is the time interval for a, a rural tower? It is uh, every tower, uh, tower every wireless company takes their entire customer base. So publicly reported numbers uh, indicate that AT&T and Verizon are somewhere over 100 million customers. Uh, I believe T-Mobile is in the 50s or 60s millions. Uh, and I forget where Sprint is in the US cellular. Okay, <laughs> so but you take the, that. The big ones, yeah. You divide that by the number of towers nationally. Right now there are approximately 300,000 macro towers nationally. So you take your 100 million, you divide it by something in the neighborhood of some hundred thousand. We don't exactly know. Those are highly proprietary, and we at the association yeah, right. don't receive it. 
Um, but you take that, you divide it, you come up with something in the neighborhood of you know, 1,000 minutes, uh, 10,000, whatever the, the number is, and that's assigned for each tower. Okay, but, I mean, we're talking 25 minutes. I think, I can understand you have a system in math. I can also understand that uh, maybe the FCC has different needs than we do. Um, we are really trying to find out how often we have people. And we don't have a significant number of people in a lot of places in the state. How often they cannot reach emergency services and how long. So in that case, the difference between 25 minutes and 24 hours is major. The difference between 25 minutes and <clears throat> three hours um, may not be as major, except to the person that has a massive coronary during that three hour session. But um, we're still dealing with large sections of Vermont, especially, you know, if you're in an automobile that have no communication. So. Well, if you take okay. the map that you've been talking about with respect to uh, the national calculation, it would be fair to say that a tower located in Vermont that has the same uh, mathematical number of users as a tower in Boston, that we have a much larger number of users than we have people here. Uh, right. So, it's, it's, so you're getting that benefit. In terms of then if a tower or group of towers went down, we would probably notify a lot faster than we would be Absolutely. based on population alone. Absolutely. So from that, are you able to tell us that if a tower or a typical group of towers, based on the way connections are made in Vermont, how many people, how many people minutes, if you will, might in fact be involved before we would be notified? So I, I can't do that. I, I don't have the, the math against proprietary, but one thing that didn't occur, did not occur during the E911 board's deliberations was an inquiry for what, our, what the carrier's numbers were. There was no outreach, there was no uh, effort to find out how long would it take 10 towers to report? How long would it take 20? They have the ability to issue discovery requests or a, a, a data requests. There were none. There was no effort to discover that information. Would you volunteer? We, again, the association doesn't have it. You are right that the members- I mean, they, they, it's a two-way right. street. We, we gave uh, what we believe to be a, a good enough it's numerical it's example. Um, but you know, one of the things that was never explored was what about a number beneath 900,000, but higher than zero? Mm -hmm. Now, you've heard about sort of old technology and old rules, and that was you know, uh, 30 minutes and, and 25, I guess it was, customers. The rationale that I heard Executive Director Neal share with you was, we don't want to hear about uh, two blocks not having service. We, that's not a you know what we what we view as a public service, uh, public safety issue. I, I would contend that a, a tower out for 30 minutes, right, may also have that same impact. Where yes, people are out. That in and of itself is a public safety issue. That's not deniable. It's not deniable. However, if a tower is out for 30 minutes and comes back on you know, in minute 31, the volume component, the volume metric, 900,000 user minutes, prevents you from, from sort of over-reporting these smaller outages that are perhaps not that impactful and pretty much resolve themselves. If you have a volume component, you avoid that type of 30 minutes, 25 customer report where, all right, two blocks were out, but do I really need to solve for that in that period of time? We understand and we take extremely seriously our obligation to keep all of our towers on all the time. It's difficult. Um, I, I believe Madam Chair talked about Hurricane Irene. I mean, this was a massive disaster. It washed out highways in Vermont, it turned towns into islands. Not as bad as the ice storm. Not as bad as the ice storm, but a lot of people in Vermont might have lost their, you know, a lot of things, but they still have their cell service in those instances. We are a lifeline. We get that. We take that seriously. We want to offer that service to our customers, but it is a massive sprawling network, even just in Vermont. It is, you know, it is highly technical, what goes on with it. And like I said, a single power supply that goes bad, for just as a for instance, at a tower site that's fixed very quickly by a tech doing a truck roll to the site, taking a look and fixing it, 
isn't that roughly equivalent to your 30 minute 25, two blocks are out? I would contend it is. I would contend that if Vermont wants something below the 900,000 threshold, that should be explored. Those numbers were not explored. We ended up with a one size fits all rule, a 30 minute reporting interval that frankly may result in reporting of outages that are fixed before the two hour uh, report comes in. That's what gets taken care of by the metric. One of the reasons you have that metric is, hey, if you get there and you fix it pretty quickly, I, do I need to know, right? We're I think, I think our it. problem is there aren't 900,000 people in the state of Vermont, so we're, the, right. these are numbers we don't even comprehend. We're trying to find a reasonable way to ascertain when a significant number, and for us a significant number is somewhat smaller than probably the rest of the world, uh, of our people do not have access to emergency services. And I think we're open, and if the carriers have information that would help us find a reasonable number, I think we would most certainly be interested in hearing that. What I'm trying to hear is, because the testimony we heard was, well, if we hear Shrewsbury's not getting cell phone, and I would say Shrewsbury was somewhat more vocal <coughs> and were without service somewhat longer <laughs> than most places. I, I don't know why, but they definitely had all of our emails and got our attention. Um, but that got our attention. And it sounded like, because when we asked the electric companies to tell us when they phone, it's a phone call. So I think we're trying to figure out, for you is it more than a secretary, you know, I say, well, we got a report, call them and tell them it's out. I mean, is it more than that that you're being asked to do? Or is well, it more complicated than that for you? I, so I'll offer a data point that might be helpful um, partially in response. Um, I, but first, let me answer your question. Um, I believe Executive Director Neal, and she would know better than I do, but I do believe Executive Director Neal knows who to contact from the carriers. Um, I would hope. If she doesn't, then we should definitely get her that information. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, well, the, I think the most of their lobbyists are in the room. Right. I'm sure they know who right. to contact. The, the carriers are very willing to work with the public safety community to make sure that they have the information that they need. If we were to receive a call from Executive Director Neal um, or a PSAP, you know, I'm, my, I'm hearing that there are some issues. They're going to answer those questions. I mean, I, I, I would hope. I, I wouldn't think that there would, yeah, that there would be any yeah. difficulty there. It, it's not the the ability to work individually to solve some of these problems. It's just the uh, what we look at is a really, really low trigger um, for outages that should be examined um, and increased. The, the number that I said I would share with you is this, um, and, and we did share it with Executive Director Neal in our comments. Um, in a five-year period, we looked at uh, 2014 to 2019, five years, um, there were 39 reportable outages. Report, outages reported to the FCC, the federal government, for Vermont, 39 in the five-year period. Now, there's no obligation to report in Vermont, was not no obligation to report right. in Vermont, so Executive Director Neal did not get those, right. like the best part of them. But why would 39 reports in that period not have been enough? 12 of those, just to, 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 to give some more detail here, 12 of those were Vermont only. They were not regional or national outages that affected Vermont. They were outages in Vermont. And that's a four. And that's twelve in five years. Right, Vermont specific outages that would have been reported under the FCC's mm -hmm. rules. Thirty nine of them would, you know, and how broadly they went into other states. Mm -hmm. You know, did they go from New Hampshire uh, to Maine, or was it just a little bit over a state line? I don't know, but thirty nine that impacted Vermont. Twelve that impacted only Vermont. And that's under the FCC's rules that we're hearing from the 911 department that are just unacceptable for Vermont. To us, that's a fair that's a fair number of reports. It gives situational awareness. It does give visibility into you know these issues. On the other hand, if the sense of it is that that number is still not enough, I still contend that somewhere between 900,000 and zero, 
there's probably a reasonable, well, yeah. I think that's what we're trying to find Understood. is, because yeah. what we don't know is how many people were impacted by those 39 calls, how many other not, I mean, how many people have to be impacted in Vermont before there's a report? I think that's what we're looking for uh, because until the carriers can tell us that um, or a rough equivalent of that, we don't know if it takes 5,000 before reports made, that's a good portion of Vermont. All right, that's half my county. Uh, not quite, but probably half Senator McDonald's county. All right, so. Um, we only have half in this. I as many people to actually report. You don't have electricity, so because don't worry about it. Um, Much of them don't even get the service that we're going to report. He doesn't have a stoplight or electricity. Um, but I, I think that's what we're struggling with, is we're trying, we, we don't, we're trying to define the problem. We know that there are times when people can't get 911. And as the note that just got passed to me said, this isn't the apartment building. I was in New York City, or I was in Boston for the 1960-whatever blackout. But I got into my third floor apartment, but neighbors were coming down the hall with candles, passing out candles, and I could go next door and use the landline. Or we didn't have cell phones in those days. But here, I can't, it, it could be three miles to my nearest neighbor, it, it, you know, in, in weather like this. So, we're trying to just get a handle on what's a reasonable number that you can deal with that makes sense to us. If it's 300 people in your outage, we might be able to live with that. If it's 13,000 people before there's a, a that probably is too much for us. So I think that's what we're looking for. Chair, sure when, when the witness came in and told us we should feel assured we were being treated as equal as people in New York and Boston, it just demonstrated that you don't understand what we're talking about. In those cities, when the outage hits those cities, they know it. And the people who would go to repair them, those problems know it. In Vermont, that doesn't work. They don't know it. And I, maybe I, I, I mean, it's just you don't want to be treated equal to them. And secondly, what is it about keeping a log of when the power is out and uh, communicating that when it's possible that? that has brought so many people to this world. What is there about our system that we don't want to have reported? What, what's the, why would the people who wake up every morning fully committed to fixing any outage as soon as possible and don't think about that while they're shaving and having breakfast, not wish us to know when something isn't out? Why? Well, I, would, I guess I would, I would start by saying there's never been an exploration of whether the federal standard would work for Vermont. The, the step one was zero. Such a question. But, yeah. but you're asking why don't we want to report? The answer is we report all the time, all the time. But Vermont is not looking at whether the existing reporting would work for Vermont. Vermont's taking the standard and going to zero and okay. saying that that's approaches just for Vermont. It's okay. been 25 and we're leaving. All right, I'm going to, no, you're in two different numbers. I'm going to start 
I'm, I'm watching the clock. We're 15 minutes behind. We've got Thank one you. more witness, and then Thank I'm you. assuming Dr. D. Nicole is waiting in the hall somewhere. Uh, on the phone. On the phone. Okay. Can you let him know? Yes, we've let him know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, because doctor's time is hard to get. Um, I think we're going to be looking at the utilities to see if you can help us figure out when you do report what size outage somewhere between 9,000 and 25, pick a number, but help us to get a, a, a handle on what size outages you are reporting um, and, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, Mr. White. Oh, no. Good afternoon. I give James you, White, you uh, get A for courage for coming up. A senior Director of Regulatory Affairs for Comcast, some members of the committee. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to address uh, the rules, the E911 uh, board's proposed rules, and, and compliment Barb and the E911 department. Michael Ben's comments said we're very cooperative as we expressed our views. A couple of rounds of comments we've talked on the phone. Uh, some of our concerns have been uh, have been resolved. Um, and then I'll talk about S193 to find. Um, one of the difficulties for a company like Comcast is we certainly know when we have outages at a certain point in the network. What we don't necessarily know is if a particular customer's modem is out. For example, an electrician could be at someone's house and shut the power off. A car could hit a telephone pole up down the road. We don't necessarily know that at a high enough level. We, the customer then would call in and they've got a trouble call. The police and the fire will know just as quickly as we do if there's a very local outage. So one of the issues in the underlying statute it, it, Section 25 of Act 2079, uh, it includes within the definition of an outage the lack of function of uh, telecommunications subscribers backup power equipment. Well, that could be a backup battery, could be a UPS, it could be something else. I mean, so, so you that don't it, know that. You don't we, know if I have batteries in my phone that are backing up. We know, we, and so part of the last year in the same broadband bill, yeah. the um, legislature required the PUC to do a workshop on backup batteries, and that report was issued December 13th, and it's certainly there for everyone to read. It concluded that uh, the VoIP carriers had um, indicated their compliance with the FCC's backup battery rules and recommended against a Vermont augmented standard. So really, backup batteries are made available. So Comcast has them. People want to buy them. We ship them. We have them available. We ship them to them. Very few people do that, to be honest. They, they well, Shrewsbury said they were sent to a hardware store in Rutland. That's, that's because they, that's they a different carrier. Different, not, ah, yes, there is a different it's, carrier. It's a, 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 a different there. carrier. So uh, and not only that, okay. all the VoIP providers, You're right. they, they operate differently. They're yep. different backup batteries. Ultimately, though, Customers make choices about their phone, you know, what, what they want in terms of a phone. Most people in their homes have a cordless phone. When the power goes out, that cordless phone is a good work. Mm -hmm. Unless you're plugged in to the back in the wall and over a line powered network. A lot of people may choose not to take a backup battery because they have a cell phone, whatever. But in any event, we don't know when there's an outage. At a, at a very, very granular level. That language is still in the statute, um, so we'd recommend that that phrase, defining an outage, lack, if that could be removed. Now, in okay, the so we've made that. Okay, so there's 25 people in the state we who have, haven't replaced the batteries. There could be, well. But then, the, yeah. The, um, Barbara Neal, I mean, they have taken account of our issue and commented that we would not, carriers like us, would not be responsible uh, for reporting um, with, with respect to customer premises equipment, which would be a battery or something, or things that are beyond our control. So that's certainly that's fine. That's in the comment. We, 
we support that, we prefer that we're in the rule because when it gets okay. to the fine, I'm sorry, yes, sir. Actually, I, I don't know who my question was directed to, but why are we talking about the rule that hasn't been promulgated yet? I think this will turn us out. B. This, this it is totally is. an aberration from the LCAR procedure. You know, the LCAR committee passes judgment on a rule, and we don't get involved before that rule passes. And sometimes we'll revisit a rule if we don't like it, or we think it's beyond the scope. But to do it before the rule is promulgated, it's oh, uh, it's all over the board. But I, mean, I think part, 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 yeah, part of it, though, is legislative intent, and they're going when that. I'm going to get a packet. So, are you, so I'm that's, get, a, that's a legitimate answer. Yes. If, you're, if you're looking for some advice from this committee, how to respond to that well, I package. Think, I think everybody is. And I think, you know, I'm going to get one of these and I'm going to have to sign off and say it's either what we meant or we didn't mean. I think what's come up during the rulemaking process is questions about how granular did we want to get and had we didn't have a lot of this information we just knew Shrewsbury didn't have phone service and Alberg had trouble getting out and we knew we knew there had been at least two instances where towns could not reach 911 we didn't know how extensive or how often that happened. And so we put in somewhere in the process, I'm not even sure it was this committee, it may have been the other body, put in asking that rules be written so that the wireless carriers, the wired, hardwired carriers have to report outages, right, at 25. We ask that the wireless carriers also report at 20. I don't even know if we said we did. Am I right? We said well, report. Well, you, in, in section 25, you did not define what the threshold should be. Right. And, and that's what one of the con conversations right. has been. And either we're going to hash it out here, or some people in Elkar are going to hash it out for us or we're going to put in a rule that... Might strike the rule, the rule because it's undefined. Right. Yeah. So it's probably better for everyone if we have this discussion with the carriers because I don't think we want to put in a rule that is unreasonable or we'll put a, a large administrative burden. We're all we're really looking for information because it's going to be expensive to work around some of these problems. Easiest and shortest way to fix it's in here. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to add one comment that the purpose of Section 25 was to create a mechanism for the 911 board to assess the impact of these various types of services okay. that have access to 911. We need to have a level playing field to do that. Right now, the wireline companies are reporting at this very, very granular level, which we think is appropriate and has served the state well for 20 some odd years. To, to, to say that that's okay for the wire lines to continue to have to report at that level, but the wireless and the, and the void can report at this astronomically higher level does not seem to me to be a level playing field. Right. And I would recommend that whatever the threshold is, we're recommending as we've got it in the rule right. there, uh, be equitable right. for all of these carriers. Which would mean, let me get, in the past eight years, we've got 240 some odd reports of outages, telephone service provider outages from the wireline companies lasting anywhere from a minute to 12 hours or more. If you apply, uh, well, I was able to determine what the user minutes involved were for 145 of those because I had enough data. If you apply the SCC thresholds of 900,000 user minutes, we would know about four of them and none of the others. Okay. 
So, so. All right. And I think what we're struggling with is because we've been told that, uh, you know, depending on the carrier and the number of people and the number of cell towers, that is that calculation may be more complicated. And I think what we need to hear from the carriers is using the FCC for you, and you can fudge it, some, you know, so we can't calculate back to any, if we were so inclined, to any, you know, business secrets. Um, but how, how many people is that? Plus or minus? A reasonable number. Okay. I would cover okay. just a couple of other yeah, points no, you're uh, fine. from Comcast. Right now, the the rule for reporting by regulated wireline carriers refers specifically to network outages. We're talking about things that happen yes. on the not at the customer premises. Right. No, I don't. That's, yeah. a, that's our issue. Uh, if that's my our line issue there. comes down in my backyard, for, for example, twenty Comcast is across the state. Twenty five people. There could be twenty five people who have an electrician at the house in twenty five different towns and there's no way we would know that if, right. if you're reporting at a network level perhaps okay perhaps it would be it has to be based on the on the network okay so it was, with respect to the fine um, we would we understand the intent that uh, uh, um, reporting is a serious okay. obligation we take that yeah. seriously um, in order to uh, uh, connect to the 911 system in Vermont each carrier has to have a contact our contact in Denver is well known to the E911 board staff so that we don't think um, that's an issue. But we would certainly um, uh, think that uh, allowing the 911 board to collect information over the next couple of years to see how what types of outages are being reported, if there's a reporting problem before moving you know, okay. to a system of fines, even then they'd have to be graduated right. based on some type of showing opportunity for yeah, explanation. Yeah, I'm not not sure why that's that bill was put in, but if we made it clear, or I guess told the board, where is your rule and process? Has it been filed? It's been filed as required by Act 79 with the Secretary of State's office and LCAR. So it's in but its it final proposed. Made, right? It's in its final proposed language. Um, I I will need to. Uh, Maria's shaking her head. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, can I, they amend it? Well, it's final proposed right now. LCAR needs to review it. And now it's scheduled to review possibly at the end of this month. So if you would like to give input, your postpone action on bills. How whatever you want. Says, yep. Hold up on it while we. Yes. That's I'm sorry. I had the septic rules in LCAR when I chaired it, and they were still an active bill in the other body, and we treaded water, no pun intended, for weeks. Just, uh, just offer one, one final yeah, but I, I think I just wanted to clarify. If we made it clear, which should be just a clarifying amendment in the rules, that we were talking about network outages that you would know about in a reasonable amount of time, that that would work. And I understand that the um, the fine as proposed without any up to's or may's it sounds somewhat punitive um, because this might happen on a holiday when you didn't have staff sitting in your office to make the phone call or you might be having a tornado or ice storm wherever your caller person was so the last just one last okay. point and that, that the PUC has now opened a workshop on the effect of electric reliable service reliability on telecommunications networks that could generate additional information that's helpful there's certainly maybe not for wireline uh, telephone service that regulated companies but for VoIP there, there is a very high correlation Okay. between whether electric power is available and whether people can use their cordless phone, whatever. And, you know, so hopefully there would be more information you there. You can use we, it for a while, but eventually you got to charge it. That's right. But thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I was just awake, everybody. <laughs>
I think okay. he's there. Dr. Nicola, are you there? Can you hear? I can hear you, yes. <laughs> we may all need an audiologist after that feedback. I don't know if you heard it. I can uh, clean my ears now. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is Ann Cummings, and I've chaired you with the Senate Finance Committee, and various members of the public are here to listen. And we are looking at S245. This is an act relating to eliminating cost sharing requirements for primary care. And <laughs> the floor is yours. Um, okay, I know some of the people on the committee, and that's good, but for those that don't know, I'll give you a two-minute summary or less of who I am. Um, I'm in my 44th year of practicing medicine in uh, Vermont. I came here as a lone pediatrician in 1976. I was in private practice for 17 years, initially by myself and then with two internal medicine docs. Um, and I signed on the Gifford uh, Medical Center. I was medical director, director at Gifford Medical Center for about 10 years, went back to doing pediatrics, and then I finished up for about three years being medical director again. I'm semi-retired. I still work on uh, weekends uh, once a month to help out uh, to cover the nursery and, and sick kids. Uh, that's, uh, that's my history. I've also been, also been very active as a board member of the Vermont uh, Academy of Pediatrics um, chapter, and I'm also a member of the uh, Vermont Medical Society. Um, uh, I have read the bill, and I've also read uh, a very recent article that was actually just published uh, a couple days ago um, uh, on this exact uh, issue. Uh, so I'll start by saying I strongly support this bill, uh, and I'll say as written, um, I'm sure there's some improvements that can and, and should be made. Uh, my biggest concern with my experience in Vermont is that um, uh, there is a declining um, number of people, uh, in this study was done in adults, but it's happening in pediatrics too, who are going in for basic care, uh, depending on the age in pediatrics, they can be every couple months for infants, and uh, after about the age of five, it's yearly, um, and uh, the number who are coming in has dropped off. This study that was done by the uh, Annals of Internal Medicine, um, and this uh, study had no affiliation to primary care funding sources, which I think is important when you're looking at a study, basically found that there has been a significant drop off of, of uh, about, um, I believe it was about 24%, and they studied the years from uh, 2008 to 2016, um, and uh, those were in private visits to primary care uh, with the same basic uh, people that they were looking at. Uh, although there are probably alternatives, I mean, uh, correction, uh, uh, there are probably many reasons why that's happened. One of the things that appears to correlate with it, if you look at the curves that are in the study, uh, is as the, um, what people call co-pay, the money they have to pay out of their pockets to go see their primary care, as that goes up, the number of visits go down. Uh, and uh, that, to me, is a concern. Uh, the reason it's a concern is that in pediatrics and in adult medicine, we know that if people come in uh, and the tradition, the old tradition of a checkup is you get your blood pressure done, you get a couple other things done, maybe your height and weight and a few other things. Checkups nowadays include, include everything from social determinants of health to uh, BMI to um, uh, you know a history about smoking, drinking, drug use, uh, many, many other things. And in many screening tests that we didn't have five, 10, 15 years ago, you know, uh, for me, very important is a PSA, which uh, I probably would not have uh, uh, gotten if I wasn't going on a regular basis to a uh, 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 physician. And I actually ended up with prostate cancer. And um, that was picked up. I've had surgery and I'm doing well. Um, so the uh, concept of primary care doctor who knows you, who understands you, who you can uh, know your history, um, uh, allows um, all of us to be healthier, healthier. And I think because you're the finance committee, uh, our biggest expenses are for chronic diseases or illnesses that are caught too late to really treat uh, uh, properly. Um, but the other thing that's kind of wrapped up in why people may not go to uh, primary care uh, docs, and this is very important to me, especially as medical director, I'm still involved in recruiting for our organization, um, 
And by the way, we are we're an FQHC, and I was uh, the medical director for that also for the last three years. Um, uh, if we look at the number of primary care docs in Vermont right now, it's dwindling. I heard of two more pediatricians who are at least leaving one area of Vermont. I don't know where else they're going. Um, and uh, so the number of primary care docs is dropping. The access to care may be dropping off. But even with, if you could, uh, control for that, the number of people who are going to their primary care doc for routine checkups and routine health care is dropping off at an alarming rate. Um, so um, uh, in the middle of all this, people are going uh, to urgent care centers, not necessarily for the yearly checkup. Uh, in fact, mostly that's not what they're saying. They're going for the sore throat, for the headache, for the rash, for the fever that they might have. Um, and uh, there's a cost to that that in many cases could have been handled with either school primary care office uh, or uh, if the primary care office is set up uh, properly, sometimes with even uh, a phone or a, um, the electronic medical record uh, uh, method. But if they're not connected to the primary care doc, then it's very unlikely to happen. Um, so that's my quick down and dirty. Of, um, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about um, uh, any aspects of the bill or any questions that you have about me or about uh, why I believe that getting rid of the copay for your primary care doc will actually improve access and improve health and over time reduce costs. Okay. Senator Ballant has a question. Uh, thank you, Doctor. I just wanted to go over when you said there was a big drop off, um, about 24 percent in the visits to uh, primary care physicians. You were saying that was over an eight year period. Is that right? Correct. Right. And, and so you alluded to the fact that in another part of your testimony that some of that may be due to um, visits to, to urgent care. Was that factored into that that data point there? No, the, the overall was the 24 uh, percent, 24 point something percent. Um, and, uh, and during that time, urgent care centers uh, were it kind of, that's when they really started taking yeah. off. Yep. Uh, but they, I think the key here is if you look at how urgent care centers work, they're basically, the way I look at them, is they're many emergency rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, and people are going in for acute care, often preventable if they had been to the primary care doc. And in this study, of 50% of the people did not see the primary care doc, even though they had a primary care doc during that time period. And I think uh, Stephanie Winters has uh, this study, and I'm sure we get it to you uh, so okay. you can look at the details. All right. Any other questions? OK, thank you for taking time. And you know, I, I do have a question. question. Uh, thank you for your testimony, doctors. Uh, Senator Pearson from Chicken. You said you were medical director um, at the FQHC, is that right? Yeah, and Gifford. And, and Gifford. So you, you have a, 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 help me just make sure I'm right here, that you would therefore have a bit of a larger view uh, of the whole sort of hospital system, um, as opposed to just being expert in pediatricians, right? Uh, correct. There's no question that I had to do reviews on everyone we employed, um, and uh, because it didn't include the subspecialists, it included all the primary care docs, and I had to do reviews on the, the adult docs. I had to do well, just uh, you know a whole uh, variety of people. So, um, so one of, one of the th concerns that's been raised here is, while most people seem to agree we we need to do better by primary care, whether it's reimbursement rates, etc is that the premise of this bill could sort of have a, a punishing effect on specialists or maybe somehow impact their reimbursements. Or, do, do, you, do you have any concerns along those lines? Or, no, or jack up, or, or that's right, the chair reminds me, or you know, one way that the insurer might balance it all out is increase the copay to go see a specialist. Should we be worried about that or, or guard against those kinds of uh, ripple effects? Oh, I think we should, but I, I think I think it's, it's very important to understand that if indeed, and, and there's, this is only one of many, many, many studies that show if people have a primary care doc 
or by, by DOC, I'm including nurse practitioners, PA. Uh, uh, if they have a primary care provider that they identify with and they go to them at least once a year for the checkup and then they go to them when they have uh, problems uh, or follow up for their diabetes and things like that, their overall health improves dramatically. Um, and at the same time, they're much less likely to go into a walk-in clinic where they're not known or show up in the emergency room. Um, and, and I think that's pointed out uh, in this study because if 50% of these people did not see a primary doc at all, that may make up uh, some, uh, some of the numbers that had showed up in the, um, in the walk-in clinics. And again, what typically happens with walk-in clinics, they don't know your history, they don't have access to your records, they don't know uh, what meds you're on, they may know what you tell them, but uh, I'm lucky I'm, I'm on one med, uh, if you're on 10 meds, you often can't even remember them. So there's a disadvantage uh, in doing that. As far as the specialists are concerned, um, I, I think if anything, and I, I don't have any paper uh, to back this up, people who go to primary care docs on a regular basis are more likely to get appropriately referred to a specialist. Most insurance companies, uh, I should say most, but many uh, require a person to go to a primary care doc before they show up in the orthopedic office to get a knee replacement. They are more likely to have someone who knows them, who can guide them to the uh, specialist uh, at an appropriate time and will in fact be getting the care that they need. I don't see uh, the numbers there. Now your point about the insurers, yes, the insurers says, well gee, we're gonna lose some money here and, and I'm not going to talk politics, but the insurers make much more money than they need. Uh, if they say that I'm going to raise by 10, 15 hours, whatever, any copay uh, you pay to go see a specialist to make up for this, that's your job and I think the legislative job uh, to really talk about that. Um, and so, yes, it's a concern. I think it's certainly not a reason to not do this uh, to do this bill. Okay, I think Dr. DiNicola, the we can't control all insurers. We can't control oh, all those self done. So what we're looking at are basically the ACA gold, bronze, silver, and they are required by federal law to keep an actuarial value. So when we take away a cost to the consumer it has to get added somewhere else. And it's right. there's at least six bills that I know of, and I'm on health and welfare, that would limit or do away with co-pays. And any one, I think, is a good thing. All of them taken together could have some major hits. So we're trying to work through and figure out where we do it. We have one on insulin. There's one on contraceptives. There's one on, what did we do this morning? Um, chiropractors and physical therapists. Um, there, and there, there's a, oh, yeah, there's a couple more. So uh, that, I think, is what we're, we're looking at. Um, the bottom line is the cost of health care is too high, or health, yeah. And I understand uh, that completely. I, I just keep going back to my roots as a pediatrician. If kids get really good pediatric care, they're going to have less health uh, issues, whether it's obesity, diabetes, or hypertension, or uh, even bad acne, who knows. Uh, uh, whereas if they're not well, they're much more likely to develop problems that are going to cost the overall system more. And the insurers need to look at that uh, this way. And that's been proven over and over again in Scandinavian countries um, where uh, people have uh, you know, um, medical care, excellent access to, uh, uh, to primary care. Uh, and uh, I believe in other countries where there's uh, excellent access. Um, so in, in the end, of course we have to look at it, but I think the base, the foundation for uh, finance, in, uh, how should I put it, improvement by finance uh, reform in medicine has to start with primary care. Uh, and, uh, I, and, and I have good friends that are specialists. <laughs> um, I, one of the biggest problems we have in this state is we have a very difficult time getting primary care docs. 
uh, that's going to get worse, not better. We also have some problems uh, with respect, uh, especially in some specialists, and I can think of three which are, are, are really uh, at risk. Um, however, uh, again, if we keep coming back to where we start, I think we start at the foundation, get everybody um, to have easy and appropriate no uh, copay to their primary care doc, they're going to be healthier, and yes, there's going to uh, have to be a balance, but the balance really has to be looked at more long term. In the end, if I keep one, two, three, four kids from getting uh, morbidly obese or getting diabetes at age 15, I've saved the overall system dramatic uh, amounts of money. Um, so, I, I, uh, and as an adult, if I'm seeing a 20 year old uh, with a chronic problem and I know them very well, the likelihood of them needing hospital care, needing uh, kidney transplants goes down. It doesn't go away, but it goes down. So. Okay. Other questions? Thank you very much for taking time to talk to us. It's uh, been helpful. Yes, Finance doesn't get to deal in health care a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm happy helpful. if Stephanie knows me and uh, if you need to talk to me again, I'm happy to talk. And I hope it's doing better where you are. We're having freezing rain here. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing out there. It's gray and it's wet. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lou. Take care. Is that Mark? Yeah. That's Mark. Hi, Mark. You, you are gifted. He has been quiet. <laughs> I listen to Dr. Lou. <laughs> you are <Hi>. unique. <laughs> okay, thank you. Should, you should you. have him here more often. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Can he talk on uh, wood chips? <laughs> All right. Where are we again? Uh, Colin Robinson, why not? You know the routine. Thank you very much. Um, for the record, my name is Colin Robinson, the political director at Vermont NEA, and we're pleased that we're able to testify here on the S 245. Uh, on behalf of 13,000 members. And, you know, Vermont NE has been involved in supporting broad systemic health care reform for all Vermonters so everybody can access the care they need when they need it at a price they can afford. And we believe S245 will do that. Um, I want to touch base on a couple brief points about why we think this is a positive step forward. One thing that we know, obviously, our members work with students every single day, and when students aren't able to access the health care they need or their families can't access the health care they need, that impairs their ability to learn. And in order for uh, our educators, our teachers, to be able to be effective at their job, they need to make sure their students are able to be successful learners. Um, the other thing is, obviously, the issues impacting educator health care across the state have been a topic this committee spent time on the past couple years. It's been a topic other committees have taken on. But the reality is the issues that were coming up in the context of educator health care are reflections and mirrors of broader systemic reform issues that are impacting everybody. So obviously last year you all in this committee took action <clears throat> on the debacle related to the third party administrator uh, mm -hmm. issue and we appreciate that. And you might remember we spoke in, in this committee on a, about a survey that we presented to uh, educators across the state whether they're members or not in the late, um, late in 2018. You received 2,000 responses from educators across the state and this was at the end of the first year of the implementation of the new VHI high deductible health care plans. And what we found in that survey, one thing that really jumped out was, and it was sad but not surprising, that 46% said that during 2018, they did not go to the doctor when they needed a medical, pro when they had a medical problem, they skipped a medical test, treatment, or follow-up recommended by a doctor, or they did not make an appointment with a doctor or other provider because of cost. Um, so that's 46% per of educators. And we know that that, once again, is not unique to them, but we believe it is reflective of... They are also of, not amongst the more poorly paid Exactly, exactly. So if that's a, that's a cost barrier facing our educators, let's think about um, how it impacts others. And so along those lines, and specifically talking about VHI, obviously the healthcare plan that school employees have, this bill wouldn't impact 
um, the majority of the VHI plans. About 8% of um, individual school employees enrolled in VHI plans actually would be impacted by this because they're in HSA um, non-compliant plans. Um, but it would impact 8,000 retirees in the VHI system. And we believe you know, any number of Vermonters having positive impacts related to being able to see their providers when they need to um, is positive. Who's paying? Is the general fund paying for the teacher's retirement health care? OPEM costs are part of the general fund, I believe. Okay, so what I heard loud and clear this morning was if we do away with those co-pays, then the cost is going to go up. That money will have to be made up, and I assume here it would have to be made up by the general fund. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, obviously, as was spoken to earlier, the and I'm going to mention in just Don't a minute. Don't tell me if they get primary care, they're going to stay healthier. No, no, what I was going to say is actually VHIs, I mean, we do, I do believe that. But specific, VHI did a, an analysis of where their spend is, and 5% of VHI's spend is on primary care, compared to 50% on hospitalization and 18% on prescription drugs. So when you're talking about what is actually having the biggest impact on, and of course the trends in VHI I think are probably reflective of trends in other settings as well, is that we're talking about 5% of the pie um, and making sure that Vermonters are accessing that early care that has impacts down the road. Um, there are other parts of the pie that there might be levers to impact that would potentially address, I think, what your question was, was driving at. Um, so, you know, VHI, I think it, it is important to illustrate that with 5% of the spend being on this, there is, um, it's, it's a low, it's a cost-effective way to incentivize the right care. Um, the sort of final point I want to make is that per Act 11, the bill that created the new statewide healthcare education bargaining structure, um, VHI cannot offer any new plans until the first year of the second agreement. And we believe that S245 could help facilitate a positive conversation about the development of future VHI plans and what that could look like in order to make sure that educators are able to access uh, the care at the right point in time. So there are other additional comments in here, but I will okay. leave it there for now. VHI is self, you're an ERISA, no, you're state employee. Mm -hmm. so are you an ERISA plan? No. No. No, I didn't think so. No, good. Okay, so so that means you're on the exchange. No, no. it's an intermunicipal. Okay, it's its own. It's your own. Thing. All right. Blue so Cross Blue Shield administers with the same <laughs> actuarial value. You're kind of neither fish nor fowl in that one. Okay. Senator Sorokin, can you explain a little bit more about why HSAs? Take, take them out for the purview of this law? Why it, there's no cost sharing in HSAs? Yeah, there are, and uh, I would defer to legislative counsel on this, but per IRS regulations, um, you That's enough. Yeah, it, it's IRS regulations. <laughs> um, basically prohibit uh, a certain amount of out-of-pocket expenses yeah. and you've mm -hmm. yeah. got them all covered in a deductible already? Yeah. So, None of your you can't you can't carve out certain things in order to be an HSA compliant healthcare plan. Okay, let's speak more toward two of you up. Okay. So we can get the federal government to change that. Okay. Maybe have a different conversation. Good luck with that one. <laughs> I well didn't I hear we were getting fabulous in healthcare and uh, That's what some said? Yeah. It's the best. So, so yes, it's the so best. best. If this were to pass and you okay. say that future contracts may take this into consideration, how, how would that work if you're still maintaining high deductible plans? So um, the bargaining about educator health care is separate from the plan development and administration. They are totally separate and segregated entities. VHI is over here, the bargaining is over here. The plans that are being bargained over are the VHI plans. Right. 
the VHI plan uh, plans are designed by the board in consultation with Blue Cross Blue Shield and Bisbet and all the other various partners. And uh, like any plan, those d redesigns happen at various points for various reasons. Um, my point about the redesign is Act 11 prohibits VHI from changing their plans until the first year of the second agreement. So okay. it's possible that the VHI board at, at some point in the next year or two will have a discussion about what plans could look like. They may decide the plans will be exactly the same, or they may decide they will okay. look different. But they can't, yeah, there's bargained agreements here. They're set and you can't do anything. That was per statute. Yeah, yeah. that was per statute. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank Great. you. Thank you all. Margaret, I guess. This committee starts to feel more and more like how many more here. Yeah. <laughs> For the record, my name is Margaret Lagus, and I represent America's Health Insurance Plans. Um, and so first off, I'm talking about 245, the um, no copay cost share right. for primary care. Okay, um, what, 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 what is America's Health It's a National Association of Health Insurance Companies. Okay. So, you know, you know, like the Cygnas or the MBDs or the whoever they have. Trade association. Association. It's a trade association. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so obviously, as you've heard, it's going to be an overall cost shift if we if we aren't spending, you know, if if our member plan owners are not spending money on primary care of their own pocket, and that falls to the insurer to make the metal levels work, that money has to go somewhere. Wherever that goes, you know, that's going to be a negotiation with the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, <coughs> It's no, it, this really isn't any different than some of the things that have already happened, like the Medicaid cost shift. We already know that Medicaid's not being fully funded, and so that cost shift goes on to insured folks. We're seeing these kind of cost shifts all over the place, and everybody has their pet thing that they want to work on. Mm -hmm. um, primary care is a very important um, point of access for folks in the healthcare system. I'm an EMT with a heart and rescue squad. Um, it's the third question that we ask people, your name, your date of birth, and who's your primary care doctor, and when was the last time you saw him or her? Um, and I will say that everybody has a primary care doctor. I've yet to go, unless you go to, you know, maybe some older woodsman or farmer or something, and they have never been to the doctor in their entire life, don't they don't have a primary care doctor. I didn't um, like but most that. people do, yeah. Is, is she a, a physician's assistant? Yeah, referred to as a primary care doctor yes. for the purpose of this testimony. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes. So primary care doctor, um, it can also be, I believe, a nurse practitioner. It can be. There's, there's a, there are many different My certifications. Care is a nurse that, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and what we do find, which is good news, that has changed over the 10 or 15 years that I've been an EMT, is that many more of our chronic disease folks with hypertension, diabetes, obesity, um, do now have a primary care doctor and do see them on a very regular basis. Um, so we do ask that question, when was the last time you saw them? It is often within the last two weeks or a month. You know, certainly more than the average Vermonter that goes once a year for a checkup. Um, I think one of the other reasons that uh, we worry a little bit ab about this language is that there aren't enough primary care physicians out there already. And so if you think that, we're, that somehow the cost of going to a primary care doctor is keeping people from going, and this is going to allow a lot more access, where are they going to go and who are they going to see? When I called for my annual physical this year, I called in June and I got an appointment in December. Um, you know, that's just the way it is. Even if you're sick, you're probably not going to get in for a couple of days. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, I, I think that there's, a, there's as much of an access problem as there is a cost problem. And so I don't think that you can equate that people don't go to see their primary care doctor every time they should with the fact that it might cost them money. It might be that they know when they call, they're probably going to be all better by the time they get a chance to see their primary care but doctor. The, and your primary care doctor will tell you if you've got a sore throat or you've got that needs immediate attention. People to are going to go to the walk-in clinic. They clinics. tell you to go to yeah. the clinic. Yeah. yeah, and so they go to the emergent care, um, and the doctor on the on the phone uh, talked about, you know, well, they won't have a med list, et cetera. Every single person that we go to pick up in Heart of Rescue, we ask for a med list, and we're handed one. Generally, if you take medications, you have a med list, and it's readily available. Um, we exactly. don't have any trouble, and and maybe that's more for chronic care people that know that that's a mm -hmm. question that gets asked of them all the time, and those maybe are the people who call us more often. 
Um, I think that this bill would cause a fairly significant metal level challenge that you've already heard about, about the 60-40 split or the 80-20 split that's required in those metal levels. Where does that go? Um, the testimony that you just heard was that, I think it was uh, for the educators, 5% of their money gets spent on primary care and a significantly larger amount gets spent on specialists. So if this money gets transferred out of this bucket and into that bucket, it, it just exacerbates what you're going to spend elsewhere. And for that patient that actually starts to need to see that specialist, that's probably a bigger hit to them than the few times you might have to go to your primary care doctor for a cold or the flu or tonsillitis or whatever it is that you have. If you have to go and see that specialist more often and now that copay is significantly higher to make up for your free primary care doctor, I don't know whether that's better overall for, the, for a Vermont person. Um, so, um, and the other thing, yep. I'm sorry. I no, just, yeah. finish, just one last thing is just to make sure that you don't apply this until we're already in the middle of rate setting, and so it would be really helpful to not apply until 2022. I, I, I got it all morning. <laughs> Shocking. The, okay. Um, th this bill is, is based on two basic things. Um, one is that out of pocket costs uh, do act as a barrier for people seeking medical care. So does the America's Health Insurance Plans agree with that theory or reject it? Sure they do. I mean any 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 barrier for you to get in, getting to see your doctor is a barrier. Okay. Um, so the second one is that uh, that access to primary care is the best way to prevent bigger, more costly, more more dangerous health problem down the road. Correct. You guys agree with that? And that's why we generally have the lowest co-pays for primary care physicians versus specialists. So, so if we agree on the two theories that make this come together, how is it that all of the professions, all of the insurers come in and then don't get us to, or all conclude that this will cost us that doesn't make sense to me. If, if we agree with the premise that you get into primary care, you save money, costly uh, treatment down the road, how can this not, over time, be a smart place to invest our money? So you're right in that if you if you have a chronic disease and you wait and wait and wait to go to your primary care doctor, then it, it may be more expensive to treat that chronic disease because you'll be at a at a you know kind of farther down the road and where it is in its progression. That is true. Um, to to try to quantify what that cost is to a system might be difficult. I don't know that you can always say, oh, this person waited six months and they came in six months earlier. That might have saved us $1,000, $10,000, $100,000 over their lifetime of treatment. That might be very difficult to quantify. I think we all agree that everybody should have a primary care physician, that they should see that primary care physician on a regular basis. But whether or not making that access entry point free of charge is something that is going to make a big difference is is a question that I don't believe has actually been answered. And the resulting change in where the money is spent in the system is also a question point for us. As I said, if you do have a chronic disease and now you've got to go and see a specialist on a regular basis and you've just bumped that cost up by $50 a visit um, and you're going to actually see that person more often than you're going to see your primary care doctor, that's difficult. I think the issue and I'm going to channel Senator Kitchell and we did it in here when we looked at providing medical care for children with autism because the testimony was I believe financial well then it was Bishka <laughs> finally agreed that if we could get care there now these kids could go to school with you know many of them could go to school without having to have a special aid and they could function, but it took a huge amount of effort input at this early stage. The problem was, and, and I know Senator Kitchell has said this, right now I have to pay, the system has to pay for that early intervention, the primary care, plus we're still paying for all the residual you know, that's out there. So in this year, and probably in the 
near future, it's not going to save. It will save us money over time. But this year, there is a base cost to the health care. And what we're doing is dividing it up. And the tendency in this building, and I got this big time in health and welfare, and we're talking about trying to make sure we do this. We had the chiropractors and the physical therapists in. One of the interesting things was this article here in the New York Times that was in our packet, mm -hmm. which essentially says that preventative care doesn't save money because as a result, people live longer and ultimately consume more things <laughs> than programs, including health care, which is an interesting which is true. observation. Yeah, I mean, that's one the reason that we, I mean, we, Social Security was set up on the concept that you died within three years of 65. That was the lifespan. Now, yeah, and now we're <laughs> living long enough to get Alzheimer's. So, um, you know, the future of health care is out there. But for this year's budget and for this year's bill, and if the cost of health insurance gets so high that employers stop providing it um, and people can't afford it at all. So we're, we're really walking this game. But this morning it was the chiropractors and the um, physical, therapists. physical therapists. And, you know, we're talking about setting their copay at, at a, you know, at a set point. Um, there's one to stop copays for contraceptives in the house. We've got one to stop out-of-pocket expenses for insulin. Um, there's, I think, one or two others that get thrown out there. But any one of them is good. All of them taken together is, is, is going to be a much larger cost shift. And yeah. it's I also think the biggest challenge is really behavioral change. You can go to your primary care you know, doctor, they'll tell you you have type 2 diabetes, you need to take X, Y, and Z steps to get that patient to go home and change their habits Lifestyle. in order to try to make themselves more healthy is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. It's a big challenge. And it's not, you know, and it's not just for diabetes. It's hypertension. It's obesity. There are all these big cost drivers, and it is very difficult. And I think what you will see is that through health insurance plans, you now get $300 a year, $600 a year if you wear a, a step, you know, a step tracker, if you join a gym, if you, you know, there are all these things to try to get people to, to put these practices into place. Um, because, you know, that's the thing that will probably save us the most money in the long run. Long run. Healthier lifestyle. Yeah. We don't get a lot of exercise. Like we here. used to on the farm, <laughs> sitting here with our computers. In fact, I've been told that health insurance is more expensive for tech people. Okay. Um, I think I'm next. You're next. <laughs> you wanted to sit here, and now we're going to do out of pocket expenses. That was very cleverly so timed. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> we don't want you to get any exercise. That's right. Up down. Don't stand up and sit down. Okay. So now I'm going to talk to you about insulin, <laughs> capping the copay on insulin. Um, so just to start, for myself, I just feel like it's necessary to lay it out. That, you know, the bottom line is the market is just plain not working with regard to this drug right. and EpiPens and a couple of others, right? This is not a novel new drug. It's, a, it's not a small group disease. It's not a drug that took 20 years and tens of million dollars to create. The drug was discovered in 1922, patented in 1923, and the patent rights were sold for a dollar so that most people would have access to this drug. Um, the biggest change in the uh, insulin market uh, happened in 1996 when Humalog came out and four years later Novolog came out. Those are the two of the most popular um, used drugs with regard to type 1 diabetes and some for type 2. Um, those at that time, 1996 and 2000, cost $21 a vial, which was about a month's worth of this product. We are literally talking 19 years ago, not late years ago. Um, in a working market with competition when Novolog came out and, and certainly plenty of people in need, lots of people with diabetes, and that's certainly not a shrinking population, it's an ever-growing um, population, the price should have been about stable. Good competition, a good, healthy, robust marketplace, 
Um, that's not the truth. Today, those same vials cost about $290 a piece. And, and it does vary, you know, some are higher, some are lower. But oh, in general, yeah, yeah. so there's, there's a wide variety, but I guess kind of on average, it's around new $290. How is it possible that especially those two drugs have marched in lockstep from $21 to $290 over the last 20 years? And in the last five years, their price has doubled. That doesn't sound like a healthy marketplace to me. Something is really seriously broken in that mm -hmm. marketplace. Um, and it's really no different than the EpiPen problem. You know, now in the back of an ambulance, we're literally drawing up Epi in a vial because we can't afford to use EpiPens in the back of an ambulance because they're too expensive. We used to leave them at the scene with families, um, you know, that, that had a child that obviously was new to anaphylaxis. Um, so today there are 30 million Americans, or about 9.4% of the population that have diabetes. This is a healthy, robust marketplace, and yet we've got these prices that are just going crazy. This bill, although I 100% understand why you want to do this and why it is important for diabetics to have wonderful access to insulin, you do not want people rationing this product. It has very negative health effects. You know, we go to see diabetics over and over again, and the first time we go, they're missing one toe, and then they're missing three toes, and then they're missing their leg up to their knee. These are horrible things to witness, and they're happening every day. This bill, although it, re it certainly reduces their pain, which is a very good thing, does absolutely nothing to the pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. They're still getting their $300 or whatever it is that they want to charge. Right, because now just more Vermonters are going to pay to help ease the pain for the diabetic patient. I'm donating to Bernie. There you go. That's what I said. You know, maybe this will all be moot in a couple of months anyway. we got an election coming up. Who knows? Um, but for right now, for right now, this is what we're dealing with. So, um, you know, I guess if, if, if you have to do this, and I can certainly see why you want to do this, um, the first thing we would ask is that it's $100 a prescription and not $100 for uh, to cover all of their prescriptions. We do believe that is that is still a significant reduction in the cost for them, and it's less of a cost shift to all other Vermonters. Um, uh, it's you know, like I said, it's still a big decrease for those individual patients. We would like to see some kind of transparency language in this law. Um, right now we have a transparency language that deals with the most expensive 15 drugs that are out there and it goes to the Attorney General's office, et cetera. Um, you just print the list. It's true, but I also think that you should, you should put them on notice that you want to know when these drugs are going up um, that they're going to have to report that as well. I mean, you may think that it doesn't mean anything to them. They fight against it. They don't like it. They don't want that out there. No, you know, no company wants that bad press, even if they're putting a lot of money in their pocket. Um, Do we find out how much is selling them to China for? I just read they dropped You don't have to go all. that far. Oh, well, no. <laughs> yeah, My yeah. son lives in Canada. But, I live in Derby. Um, well, that's a question of the particular drugs. These are brand name drugs by and large, aren't they? Yes. I suppose, mm -hmm. Are they, in fact, cheaper in Canada? Uh, many of them are cheaper in Canada. Yes. Yeah. Significantly cheaper? Uh, I don't know what the... I've never gone up to, to price them. Um, it's one of the ones where there, there isn't generic competition for... Mm -hmm. they, so the pharmaceutical companies have also very cleverly used some laws that pass in order to, to keep their products, to basically to keep the generic alternatives off the marketplace or the, you know, yeah, so there have been those things. Well, but remember the, the, the young man who was in here the last time on this bill, and he was mentioning the huge prices, so yeah. I sent him off. I don't know what, whether you use it, but I sent him off a, the name of a pharmacy and a phone number where you could price what was available in Montreal, and secondly, the name of a physician's group that will see Americans, Americans immediately sure. in order to write a new prescription. And uh, did you hear what the price difference was? I haven't heard yet, um, but I, I suspect that if it was not a generic drug, I suspect it would be considerably cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, I think we And then there are the pharmaceutical companies here that my family member, I think it was $1,500, and he ended up getting it for 30 because his doctor had a connection with this community pharmacy. Right, and Harvard Health Center has the same thing. They have QHC send access. Send yeah. it, yeah. But that's... No, that's well, this overall truth in pricing, yes. as far as, and, and also, the, in effect, the right to shop, the, 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 the availability of pricing is very difficult in pharmacies now. Often you go in, and you ask for the price of a drug, and they can't tell you the price of the drug unless you give them the prescription so that they can fill it through your insurance company, as opposed to really clear, transparent pricing systems. And if, if we were ever to do something legislatively, I think that would really be a key thing. So the can see, for not just for pharmacy, but also for common medical procedures. 
so that you can go out and shop. It's in fact the law in Vermont. We've never carried it out. Mm -hmm. Well, I think Blue Cross has testified that you are one of their policy holders. You can get on and see the prices charged um, for procedures or for procedures in pharmacy. We have both a pharmacy app and a medical app. Okay. It's a little bit of work to find the To places. find, okay, but it's out there. I yeah, mean, the pharmacy stuff somewhat. is typically priced, just at, at least in my experience, the same throughout. However, yes. There, there are, you know, of, of some stuff that I take, I know significant differences. And then there are also these things like GoodRx and Bing, you know, the folks who have negotiated prices, and they can be substantially less. Oh, yeah. Than, no, and, and I and, think that. But, but in short, of, of people doing trial and error, you know, through long list of things, it's almost impossible for people to price that. And, and that's something I think we should do something about. And it is more than. You know, the, it's, it's the far, very few pharmacies you, because we did, we called them all. Mm -hmm. They're within ten, twenty dollars. You know, there's all kinds of price, but a thousand dollar differential um, is beyond any kind of normal market thing. And so, if you find the right place, but most people when they're sick don't do that, and. When your doctor tells you this is what you need, you do it. And I'd like, yeah, and I think you were on this committee. We spent several years doing a lot, and we probably gave Andrew gray hair doing it, um, a lot of trying to get a handle on pharmacy prices. And uh, it was challenging. Um, it sounds like Maine, because we did a lot of work with Maine. It sounds like Maine is back on the active status again. And we might start trying to do it along with Florida, you know, doing an importation bill. From yeah, we're trying I think there are a lot of states that have really come to that breaking point. It is a breaking point. I mean, that is one of the driving costs. And I don't know how you tell a mother with a kid with cystic fibrosis that we're not paying for your medication. And that's a new medication. And you get it. And I don't mind right. paying for that. But when you're paying almost the same amount for insulin, that's when, or an EpiPen, both of when have been around forever. 1920s, both of them. Yeah. And you know, um, that's when it gets to be just unconscionable. Can I ask you, the, yeah. did, did, did you say earlier that the uh, pharmaceutical companies changed the laws? No, <coughs> they did. I didn't say that they changed the laws. No, I said they cleverly use the, the laws. <laughs> that, okay. Yes, I know Mike is up next and we've got 10 minutes. So oh, I think we've gotten into venting our spleens. Um, Senator Schrocken, did you have a specific question? I, I have a question for I can't see. From Blue Cross Blue Shield. All right. Uh, like you say, I went to one pharmacy and I wanted to charge $900. And my doctor told me, go to this pharmacy and you can get it for like $36. Mm -hmm. That's the community pharmacy. So, and it turned out to be true. Yeah. Same drug. Mm -hmm. So, my question is for the normal person who has not Medicare, but just commercial insurance. And there's a co-payment on the drug. Is it subject to allowable expense under your plan, or could the pharmacy bill above the allowable, allowable expense charge? If you're buying the drug through your insurance, they should not be charging you more than the copay. Some of what's happening, and Brian Murphy can explain it better than I can, is that you're buying the drug without using your insurance and taking a rebate directly from the manufacturer, and then there's a different scenario going on in that situation. You're not actually using your insurance coverage. You're purchasing the drug without insurance. Yeah, I had a constituent tell me she not have health insurance for pharmaceuticals. And went in, got like $300 bill, and he said, oh, I'm not, you know, I can't afford that. And she said, just sit there for a minute. And the pharmacist got on her computer, and the next, you know, within 15 minutes, it was $30. Well, how would you do that? Well, we've got 
coupons and it, it's like you go to the grocery store with your coupons. Mm -hmm. We've got it, it, it. Maybe we should do. We've got a pharmacist from Brattleboro, I think, that loves to do this. But Brian is really good. Brian's available, yeah. and he can explain some of that and far he, better than I can. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he is just really good in the, the basics. Your your pharmacy really has about as much control as you do in a lot of these things. They they tell them what they can charge, and they tell them what they're going to pay, and that's it. Do the European systems have coupons? <laughs> Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. Um, I, it's uh, pretty unusual in this world to actually think that um, there's a new idea out there. And um, this uh, concept came to us in the middle of the hospital budget season. Um, and uh, we've done, the Healthcare Advocates Office has done a great deal of work researching it, making sure that it's legal and that there's no case law against it and that um, it could actually work. And on, on a high level, um, the idea is to, um, well, let me just describe, I don't know if you spent any time understanding 340B. No. Um, but on a high level, um, 340B uh, the, the difference between the retail price and the 340B price is a red. What's the 340B? And the 340B price, I believe, is set by the federal government. Is What's with the vet <coughs> and the FQHCs all have access to, is that right? Yes, so there's a, no, a number of providers, and they're trying to fly very high here. The okay, difference between fine. the retail price and the 340B price is a revenue stream for a certain set of providers. And um, that revenue stream is very important to those providers. Providers being doctors? Those providers being hospitals and FQHCs and a few other. Okay. Um, and, um, and, and I am focusing on hospitals here. And I want to remind us that we have a whole set of hospitals in, here in Vermont who are not in great shape, uh, who are struggling. And so I have a very, I'm proposing a very narrow, very narrow slice of using the 340B price as a reference for the, what is allowed to be charged the consumer for insulin only. If the 340B price applies, and there's a lot of details behind that statement, it has to be the right kind of provider, and has to be the right medication, and has to be the right pharmacy. If the 340B price applies, then the consumer can only be charged, what I'm proposing, 150% of the 340B price plus a reasonable dispensing fee. So to give you an example, um, Victoza is an insulin product that costs 295, the, the um, national average drug acquisition cost is 295.57 a vial. $300 a vial. The 340B price is $15. And so I'm proposing to limit the amount that you can, show, you can charge the consumer or their plan for that matter. The 340B price plus a reasonable markup for the provider and for, um, and for the uh, dispensing fee. Uh, a much less expensive insulin product, uh, Lantus, is uh, $27 a vial, $27.24, and the 340B price is three cents. Three cents. Yes. Now, how are the 340B price set? I believe it is set on a national scale by, by the federal government, and that hospitals that uh, uh, drug companies that um, and drug uh, certain set of drug companies are required to participate and is it 
Um, Diva, I know every time we look at it, Diva says, do not touch our drug prices because they do have some connection with 348. I believe that in many states, 340B prices apply to Medicaid, not Vermont. Not Vermont. Because Vermont has argued that they can do better in the um, Maybe they have. I mean, the, all um, I know is every rebates. time healthcare looks at it, they tell us just leave us out because we're doing very well. Um, so. Oh, this will get people in here. So I recognize that I. No, I, I think this is a great. I don't know. I'll email it to you. And it's probably up on the website. It's on the website. Um, so I don't need to remind us. I, I, you, you guys have heard great testimony on how important this topic is. We get calls at the Healthcare Advocates Office about people who are not taking their insulin, who can't afford to take their insulin, um, and um, and I and I want to. Um, and so I, I, this comes sort of a little bit in desperation. Uh, where do we go? to make this work. And I, I really, I want to caution us. Um, uh, I think this is an interesting idea if done right and very in a very narrow fashion. Um, the hospitals, Vermont hospitals reported <coughs> in their 2020 budgets uh, expected revenue of 62.8 million, $62 million in 340B revenue. Um, and it, that's what they're buying it for and what they're charging this, patients within the hospital? This, this is of all 340B drugs. This is all not in Okay. But Sorry. It's, they aren't selling them to the public. They are, that's what they're charging me when I go to the hospital and they give me an aspirin. They, Generally charge me what I would pay for a bottle of that. So again, I want to make a disclaimer that I'm, I've been been studying okay. 340B, Treasure. and I've learned a lot about it. And um, and if I get something wrong, somebody who knows it's gonna should wave at me. Um, okay. I. David does do 340B pricing. Vermont Medicaid does do 340B. That's for just paying 340B. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's yeah. I Thank thought you. they. Um, um, I am proposing this for commercial only. I think this makes sense for commercial only. This is for people who but have. But can commercial out of buy it at 340B prices? Are you telling the insulin companies that mm -hmm. they have to sell it at? So I think it's, it's, a re it's a really important point for me to make. I am not proposing any change to the 340B program. It's okay. a federal law. Right. We can't touch it. It's federal law. I am proposing that Vermont hospitals charge consumers a rate that is reflective of the 340B okay. price. But some, many hospitals don't participate in 340B. They don't have pharmacies. I understand that, you say that all in Vermont? Vermont hospitals participate in 340B. Um, but they don't sell pharmaceuticals to the public. I can't go up, yeah. at least I don't think I can go up to CVH and get my prescription filled. So I'll, I'll be the first to recognize that there's some flaws in what I'm suggesting here, uh -huh. that there are people who get their insulin from a con community pharmacy uh, that doesn't participate, um, and that this well, they can participate, and that this price wouldn't uh, wouldn't help them. Okay, so you're only talking uh, I'm, about hospitals or pharmacies that purchase <coughs> through the 340B and get the 340B price and sell and sell to the outpatient. That is actually, if you go back to the history of 340B, <laughs> the idea to get these drugs at low cost prices to the hospital to get them to their patients right. was to benefit the patients. But they, the people who were selling it, either the pharmacies or the it's hospitals, didn't pay attention to what they were paying they, for it. They, 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 just, okay. they charge retail. But if I'm paying $600 a month now for insulin, 
even if I'm told I could get it for $30 or $45 a dose, maybe $100 a month, mm -hmm. if I had to <coughs> print off to UVM Medical Center or to a local FQHC, um, that would give me an option, might not be the most convenient option, but it would be an option. Right. Okay, I'm gonna have to close this. You have dropped this bomb in the middle of the table. We'll see where it goes. Uh, but the treasurer is standing in the hall, and I have a feeling we might need, can we do a break in five minutes? Thank you. Um, I don't know if Faith told you, but I am, I assume most members of the committee are getting letters yep, they or say emails. You de we demand. We demand that we fix and we are wasting and um, their pension is about to be a stranded asset and I'm not sure how many people actually know what a stranded, stranded asset, asset is. Um, I not don't a remember that from accounting class. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> So uh, for the record, Beth Pierce, the state treasurer, and I want to thank you for the opportunity today as opposed to tomorrow. It's going to be a rough day. But, well, that's uh, what we're all talking about is apparently the Senate is open, but I don't know how many yeah. people are going to be here. Well, we've got a big meeting scheduled for about 40 tomorrow, so we'll see how that goes. But, uh, but uh, so the topic is, uh, is I'd like to switch it around and talk about environmental, social, and governance and how divestment fits into that. So, um, back in 2013, 14, 15, we had a lot of discussion about the divestment uh, uh, issue in terms of fossil, uh, fossil fuel free investments. And um, uh, we did a study, my staff did a study uh, with our, uh, at the time, our investment director, as well as NEPC, New England Pension Consultant, who's our advisor. And I want to point out, they don't get money for saying, I got you a big deal here, you know, you do this investment. They are an independent fiduciary to, to, uh, okay. to the fund. So you pay them a fee to manage your investments. They do not No, get they don't paid. manage your investments. They okay. advise us on they investments. They advise us. They are not getting paid by the coal company. They're not getting a commission for sending Absolutely, you okay. absolutely. And they're not getting commissions on management uh, investments as okay. well. Uh, so they wouldn't, you know, get you a short-term investment that's very great, great and then, you know, in, in a problem down the road. So um, we did a study, they did a study. Our studies were very comparable in terms of um, result, not, not separate process. And we thought that uh, something in the area of $9 million uh, per year is uh, what we came up with. I don't have the figures in front of me, and I apologize. So $9 million a year for what? The cost of doing divestment. The cost of doing divestment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I don't have the number exactly in front of me. I'd have to look, but it was several okay. million dollars. I believe it was nine. It's been a while since I looked at it, and I apologize. It's been a, I was out of the state for two days, and then uh, uh, we've been doing a wild committee to committee today. Okay. But. So is that is that based on the mechanics of moving the money or the depletion of the you know, the, the weaker returns if you were not okay. invested possible? There's transaction costs. Those are one time, but this was really on the selection. For instance, right now we have a lot of things that are in, um, uh, uh, there are two issues. One, if you if we have things that are in commingled funds, and if we were to move those to others, it would be more expensive. Uh, than, than the co-mingled fund. And if we try to direct the co-mingled fund on what to invest, uh, we, we would not be able to stay in those funds. We also have a number of funds that are um, essentially, um, um, I'm trying to think of the terms, I apologize, neutral funds uh, or uh, uh, that are basically do not have any fees. So we do the S&P 500, for instance. If you were to add to that a, a level of, um, of additional uh, either a negative search or a positive search on it, you'd have additional basis points on those, and those would cost money. Uh, in addition, uh, we thought that um, uh, uh, restricting the types of it and restricting it out of certain classes of investments would, would have an issue in terms of risk and concentration risk as well as um, um, diver diversification risk. So at the same time, there were a number of studies by advocates that had a different story. And um, um, what we said is that we would like to get past this dueling studies and have someone else take a look at it. 
and what we offered to the environmental community, and we had a series of meetings which are on our webpage. You can listen to the audios if you like. Uh, we set up a scope of how, what kind of study we would want to do, and uh, we had very large participation. Uh, VPIRG was there, Sierra Club, Clean Yield, um, trying to remember the, a couple of the others, uh, but uh, they, we had very good representation. And uh, we came up with a scope, and we said, you pick three pension consultants, not, not um, environmental activists or not the coal industry on the other side or the, or the, um, or the um, uh, fuel industry on the other side. Um, I, I went like this. I didn't go that. Okay? Um, I went like this. Okay. Um, and um, um, so we said, pick three, and we'll do an RFP, a mini RFP, and we'll pick one. So we ended up with Pension Consulting Alliance, PCA. They're a national firm. They've done work on this issue, and in fact, they put a very good um, 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 listing of bibliography or bio of, of, the, of the various sources on this before we even met them. They're, they're very proficient in this area. So they did a study. And they met with both people on the, the fossil fuel side and representatives. You were there. And they also met with 350, oh, I'm sorry, 350 was the other one. So 350, VPIRG, Clean Yield, and, um, and Sierra Club. When was this? Um, this was back in 2017. Okay. It all meshes together when you're, you know, when you're doing all this stuff. I understand this. What day is it? Uh, yeah, exactly. So, um, so in 2017, and I stepped back and my staff stepped back. We were a resource that people asked us information. Okay. But the deal was, you know, if Andy sent information to PCA, he also sent it to 350, Sierra Club, and so on. If they sent information, they shared it with you. We stepped back and said, we've set up the scope. We're having an initial meeting with you folks, and I don't want, I'm not going to be involved anymore, me yeah. and my staff. Unless, but the staff did get requests for information, you know, what's your asset allocation, yes, things like yeah. that. Um, and I think it was around, I know it was Christmas Eve when they came out with the study because um, I, I Maybe was... Maybe why we missed it. No, I was at, I was at the cake with my son. Um, I was having a seafood platter, just for the record, but uh, it was very good. Um, and they came out with it, and it basically supported our... They didn't put the number of dollars, but they said substantial dollars, you know, um, in, in, in losses diversification risks, and they recommended that we not divest. So then, but they did have in there a number of ideas about how you can lower your carbon um, uh, footprint, how you can be a better citizen there. And we adopted a policy, a five-point plan, which is on our webpage, uh, a letter from me to VPIC, uh, which is the Pension Investment Committee, asking them to endorse these five policies. And those are included now in something called environmental, social, and governance, which is on the front page of my um, of my uh, of our not my of the treasurer's uh, web page. And if you look in here, I'm going to try to find the page. We go through all of those points, and we and we talk about what our progress was to date on these. So um, there we go. So a couple of things. For instance, there were five recommendations. So if you go to page, what's page number? Uh, page 15. And you go through. So the first one was to develop a policy. So when we do investment manager search, we require them all to come in with um, environmental, social, and governance policies and risks around those. And uh, and said that we recognize these and uh, and they would not be considered out, uh, in, in isolation and would be part of our decision making process. And we implemented a policy. Clean Yield helped me write the policy recommendation to the VPIC, and the VPIC adopted that. Um, so we, we, we did a good job on that one. If you go to, um, uh, and you see a series of, series of uh, entries in here. So if you see this on page, page 16, the ESG, ESG integration. So this is now something that any PC does when they're doing a manager selection search for us. And they're looking at these issues and they're scoring them on these issues and providing a summary to us along with a package from the prospective manager of, their, of how they integrate it, so basically a, a review of that. Uh, you'll see that based on that, uh, we've had a couple of things based on page 17. And I'm gonna give you, I love this vendor, it's called Acadian, and they, do, they, they work with us, um, and they put in, they, they essentially put in the presumption there will be a carbon tax in, into their model looking forward. And what they do is they, they essentially are decarbonizing by virtue of that, so that what they're looking at is putting more of an emphasis on that, and by virtue of that, they pick up more more firms that are energy friendly, uh, to be very candid. Okay. 
And if you see that they've reported some, some improvement in our portfolio with them because of that. Um, if you also I'm sorry, see. I'm sorry, Treasurer, are you lost me on that? Can, can you go over that? Sure. Again? So go, go back to page 17. Yeah. Yep. And you, um, so you see that uh, Cadian applies, they, what they do is when they're looking at a company, they assume in the metrics of carbon tax. <coughs> And when they do that, you know, it's going to be the potential, you know, to, uh, to, to a more of a low carbon economy. If you look at the end of that, we asked them, how are we doing? And they said, according to the benchmarks and where we are, we, you know, our combined, you know, we've reduced um, uh, certain benchmarks in terms of um, our energy, um, our, our carbon footprint. So there's measurable results. Okay. It's the short answer that because... We are invested in mutual funds, in commingled funds. We are not uh, out there alone buying, but we are buying in mutual funds, which is the safe thing to yep. do. Um, that we went out with all the environmental, the major environmental mm -hmm. groups, including B. Perg and the Sierra Club, chose a consultant to help us evaluate where we were, what we were mm -hmm. doing. And we have, a, you know, $9 million is a lot of money mm -hmm. to take out of yeah. the... And again, I want to, that's my memory of it, but it's All in right, that range. But it was millions, yeah. right? That, you know, there were some fiduciary concerns with that. Mm -hmm. And what we are doing now is we are working to, as we make new purchases, move ourselves into greener investments. Uh, that last part about purchases, we don't purchase directly. We buy the managers. We, put, we contract with the managers and they make the perfect, uh, okay. purchases. So we don't make individual investment selections. But I would say that they are greener in okay. their approach. So we are, we are asked our investment managers to mm -hmm. be greener in their approach yep. to where we invest our funds. One of the things that we did in here, so we have a five-point plan to lower our carbon, you know, carbon footprint to be to be citizens there, and they're all listed in here. The progress on all of them. Uh, one of them is not so much progress, but four out of five, I think we've done a very good job. And the other thing that you should look at is on page 55. We asked each manager to give us their position on um, on energy issues, climate change, how they're baking that into the into their investment process, and I would recommend say to you that you know divesting that say of a hundred million dollars from somebody when they have twenty billion dollars of investments or a hundred billion dollars of investments, if you can move the company to think about this rather than divest your hundred million, you make a great deal of progress. Now, what we did is just, sure. I've heard you say that for years, and and that. That we can petition fossil fuel industry to mm -hmm. behave better mm -hmm. is a complete slap in the face of the science, which recognizes that you've got to leave it in the grant. There's a reason for that campaign. You cannot keep burning it, burn it more gently. Mm -hmm. the, the goal is not to have Exxon Global be more responsible, it's to shut them down. And I, 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 what I don't understand is that is, is the, the you know, coal. Are we still invested in coal? Is Not it, to my knowledge. The, 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 what's the big fund called? The, 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 uh, Rest the index fund? Well, the, the big one that we can't specify. The, the, uh, you have a term for it. I think it's a mutual fund. But it's the, commingled. The commingled fund. Mm -hmm. None of those are in coal? Uh, we can't, I don't know what's in the commingled funds. We don't have any investments, so what, in direct investments in any coal, to my knowledge. Right. You've done a nice job with our direct investments, mm -hmm. but the commingle fund is the bulk of the pension. Yep. Coal, as they've been going out of business, cited in its reasons divestment. This works, and what I what I don't understand is how our analysis is different from the Rockefellers. It's pretty ironic. They've divested from the Catholic Church, from Green Mountain Power, from from university, uh, from the Cal retirement system, the University of California, from Harvard, from New York City's uh, divestment, the country of Ireland's divestment. These people are, are, are not, you know, wild and crazy with their money. Why is our analysis so different? <coughs> what, why, why do we face roadblocks 
that these other people have either figured out how to get over or just if they just shrugged off losing nine million bucks a year I find that really hard to believe okay so what I would say to you is that um, uh, I understand the coal industry and you know when we talked when we had a piece of coal what we you know of, a, of an investment we talked to those folks and said why and we went through that process with them and in one case there was a company that was transitioning out of coal and, um, and we stayed with them it's not real how to say this it's not there's some gray areas and let me be very keen so I'll take TA um, um, uh, uh, to tell uh, investments in um, in France so on the carbon the dirty carbon list so they have been um, and they own 60% of a solar company and when that solar company and by the way one of the vendors in this state uses their product okay when that solar company was in trouble during 12 when the market wasn't I think it was 2012 they gave them a billion dollars of cheap financing so you know what do we say to Total? you know in, in the process so I think there's some issues there I am not convinced I am not convinced that giving up the, your, your, your shares is going to cause divestment of the, of the fossil fuel industry number one and number two when I give up those I think I'm walking away from the table and I'm saying it's your problem go forth and and I've left it and somebody else is going to buy it and they're not going to be as, as, um, as activist as we are. And I think that's a mistake. I think you're walking away from the problem. I think that divestment is the easy way out and not the strong way out. And, um, and you know, by virtue, we, we're talking to the agencies, we're working, I mean, the investment managers, we're working the problem. And I think that when you walk well, away... What's the end point for ExxonMobil? Where, where do we convince them to go? Okay, well, they're not, doing research. You don't you watch TV? Well, I'm not going to get into it. Don't you watch the lawsuits? They're, they're, they are, they are, yeah, they're, they're, but they the also have the money of, to... You know, we, we, we didn't decide we would play nice right. with tobacco and see if we could... They, they cause cancer, now they've been... I hate to bring this up, but, of of but what happened with tobacco was that the, the VPIC did an analysis of the costs yeah. and made the determination. That's called procedural prudence. They sure. did their job. We did our job with procedural prudence, and substantive prudence means that you follow the, re the results of that. We had somebody independent of my office do this, somebody that VPIR... Somebody that the Sierra Club I, I remember you. the process. Yeah. And and yet other people who who have a similar fiduciary responsibility arrive at a different conclusion. Okay, and, you know, divestment was very effective in South Africa. That's the last time the legislature stuck its fingers in okay, that well, same I would, way. I would argue also that New York State uh, has not divested. Others have not divested for very similar reasons. So sure. I think you sure. cherry picked some of those to be very frank. Others have not. We did our study. We looked at it. We've come up with a five-point plan, which we are working on, and we're going to report annually. I've asked folks to help me, the environmental community, with developing better metrics. We're moving up that way. I would also point out that um, we have a fossil fuel-free investment in all of our optional funds, so the deferred comp fund, the 403B, which is essentially deferred comp fund for, uh, for teachers, uh, our defined contribution funds, and the pickup of that option is less than 0.5%. I don't have the figures in front of me the last time I looked at it. The pickup of that by individuals who have the fossil fuel free option is not very great. Now, I tried to advertise it. I worked when it, we first put it together with somebody, um, uh, I was about to say JT as opposed to TJ, I can't remember his last name, over at, uh, at, um, at 350 at the time. Let me make sure we got the message out. But it's not a big pickup. And the reason it's not a big pickup is, well, I'm not going to take a guess at that. But the bottom line is there is an option for folks to have their voice there. We have our voice in the, co in the, in the room with uh, the corporate room uh, on these things. And one of the things you might want to take a look at is a book by Daniel, or David, what is it? Daniel or David? We've got a hundred copies of the book. You think I remember the name. But he, he's talking about your shares and the ability to change the uh, um, the um, uh, the corporate process through environmental, social, and governance. And by the way, his, his, the, I'm going to link it to another subject: defined contribution plans. Okay. And one of the arguments against a defined contribution plan is you lose your ability to go to the um, um, to the corporate uh, room to make changes. And we are making changes, which is why the corporate world is coming back and trying to make it harder to do that. If if you really want to help. 
take a look at the SEC and what they're doing and what's going on in Congress to reduce the ability of folks to be able to have their voice heard in corporate rooms through the proxy process. They're doing it because it works. And I would argue that you know that is the strong approach. We're going to continue to engage these folks, and I think that for me, uh, engagement works. We're making we're, we're, and divesting is walking away from the problem, and I don't walk away from problems. Would we be able to understand some of the success of our corporate activist strategy? What what uh, is that listed in here? Uh, I think you should read the report. Yes. Okay. So. All right. Okay. Have, Any we, other have questions? we divested in anything? We don't. Uh, we divested from the South Africa, emissions. South Africa, way back, and um, and uh, tobacco. Tobacco was done after the deputy treasurer at the time, a guy named Mike Smith, um, did um, did a report to the committee on the relative risks in, uh, to that. He did what I would call again procedural prudence, and based on that, we had substantive prudence by the board. To, to make a move. To me, that's the job, fiduciary job, of a pension board. And mixing politics into this, doing legislative changes, uh, just um, um, is setting a, uh, a slippery slide that you don't really want to go down. And I would argue that we are making changes. We are more productive through engagement than divestment. And we continue to be there. And we'll continue to work on, this, this, um, on these issues. Um, we are now doing more work on co-filing and actually filing um, uh, uh, proxy petitions uh, this time around. Uh, uh, in fairness, uh, when, uh, when, when uh, this was brought up, and I'm guessing around 14, 15, uh, the argument was we had not made any, any, any uh, had not participated in any proxy processes. As of last year, we had 17, and this year we're way over that, uh, you know, in terms of our process. We're engaging companies. And if it isn't effective, then I don't know why people in Congress and, um, are, are trying to, um, to, to limit our voice. Uh, they're doing it because it is effective. So, so the, is the decision rest with you? Or no. Does it rest with the board? It rests with the board. I, I also like to point out that I know that everybody's demanding this of me. I'm a member of the board. There's a seven member board. Um, now, I am also the, um, the one that has some of the staff. Okay, that uh, that supports this, but I did not pick the investment consultant, NEPC. We did an RFP for Pension Consulting Alliance that the board approved, and the board makes the decisions. And I would recommend that you take a look because we do have an ESG policy out there that we adopted in 17. And but the board, I made the recommendation on the five point plan. I made the recommendation on the ESG policy, um, but uh, I'm one vote in the process. Um, the VPIC is a separate entity from our office. The chair is a guy named Tom Galanka. Uh, he is he is reimbursed. Um, a um, he gets a third of whatever I make, is, so it's not big money. But he is the uh, he is the um, essentially uh, uh, the other six members of VPIC pick the chair. So the tobacco one was that done by legislation? Uh, no, it was done by prudence by the board okay. uh, under okay. Governor Douglas. Uh, with Mike Smith as the deputy treasurer doing the analysis, presenting it to the board, and making a decision to do that. I, I can't remember all the details. I don't know if it's analogous, but I worked on behalf of Clean Yield mm -hmm. and got a bill through when Secretary Douglas was treasurer mm -hmm. to de divest from any corporations that did business with Miramar. I'm not aware of that one, um, and I don't know what the impact was. I'm not aware of I, any specific. I assume specific. it's a lot smaller than what's being asked for. Yes, yeah. but he, but he supported that. Yeah. He supported the legislation. So mm -hmm. I guess it's possible that legislation could. I, I think it's a, I think it's a bad precedent to put politics into, into the issue. You know, you look at right now. There were movements all over the country. One is on guns. One is on coal, one is on, um, on uh, corrections, another one is on don't divest, uh, divest from Israel. There's another one that says don't divest from anybody that divest from Israel. Was the South um, Africa one done by the legislature? Um, yes. Both yes. the legislature and the VPIC. I read the minutes. I read the minutes of the VPIC. They were working at the same time on this issue. Um, but, I, and, and, you know, the, the minutes are available if anyone would like to look at them. 
Um, but the point, and there's one group in California that said divest from any, any terrorist countries and included the United States of America on the list. Okay, I get it, it's important, and I appreciate the work that 350 has done with the divestment movement because it's raised awareness, and I appreciate the, part, the compassion that they have, uh, a passion, excuse me, and I com uh, completely um, support the fact that they're raising awareness, and, I, and again, I appreciate that. Divestment is not the answer for this portfolio. I can't tell you about other portfolios because I haven't examined them. Uh, the VPIC hasn't examined them. We've looked at, we've had a professional consultant look at it, and we've come up with a plan to lower our footprint, and I think that that's a responsible way to go. When you say this portfolio, does that mean all funds that we have, or is it uh, No, um, uh, the portfolio for VPIC is a separate trust. Um, it's a pension trust, and once you put the money in, you can't take it out, you know, if somebody wanted to use it for appropriations or something. Right. It's about four right. points. Six billion, we're seven, we're approaching five billion. Um, it's a separate trust. We also have uh, money in our office uh, that you, you folks legislate and do revenue, and those dollars come into us, and we use them to pay the bills, and we use the residual amount um, as well. And then we have something called a trust investment account, which is something that was set up by the legislature many, many years ago, and before I was deputy. Um, and essentially what happens is they put certain money in there that they thought they would have long, longer, for instance, to back the trust money, which, with all due respect, was spent, you know, despite the, uh, that we put it in there. One of the favorite words that you folks have is notwithstanding anything to I the love contrary. That word. Yeah, and uh, so, that, so that money was depleted. The Higher Education Trust Fund is in there, a couple, some wildlife funds, and there's some that are specified by the legislature and others that can be put in. Uh, by uh, by the decision, joint decision of the Secretary of Administration and the Treasurer. Um, and uh, that earned about 6.7% last year. The by far the big one, and, it, the, and the, the governing board is the Vermont Pension Investment Committee, of which I'm a member. I have one vote. Thank you. So. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> you have to just get. Starting last, uh, <clears throat> early last summer, there were some articles about the insurance companies and big banks and mm -hmm. people that are up in the too big to fail categories mm -hmm. were writing off coal plants uh, mm -hmm. you know, halfway through their lifetime yep. in anticipation of, of you know, um, losing their investments in there and trying to yep. write them off now. Is, is, well our investment managers, and that's why we have conversations with them about climate risk and the stranded asset theory, which is that you're going to, the research and development that you're doing now and, and getting more supplies, if the 2% um, uh, excuse me, two degree um, scenario would not, uh, uh, you're not, you're going to end up with stranded assets. It's, in other words, you know, you can't use them and you spend a lot of money developing them and, and, and gathering them. Um, so we asked them about the stranded asset theory. Uh, you know, the company is not going to be in business to lose money. Just and so, so insurance companies look at this, coal looks at this. The uh, uh, climate change is now on the agenda of the rating agencies. Uh, so when they came and talked to us, or we went to them, um, they, uh, they asked us about climate change. And we talked to them about that, uh, as did other states. I checked with other treasurers. And bottom line for them is that they want to make sure that investors uh, that buy our bonds aren't going to be have trouble with either you know climate risk or risk mitigation you know floods or whatever um, the cost of Irene okay um, to this state um, and it's it's not a whatever that was a very important uh, event and a very tragic event but um, so they're all looking at it and the companies that our managers are buying look at it again um, when when, uh, when Acadian is going out that the, the, they've created something they call the decarbonizer to look at it. Okay? Other companies are doing that. BlackRock is doing that. They recognize, they recognize that this, you know, that, that there's a changing economy and they're investing appropriately. <coughs> Nobody's going to invest in a company that they think is going to fail. You know, and uh, for me, um, we have to leave, we leave the investment management to our managers because we're small. $5 billion or 4.7 or so isn't sounding very big. I mean, it sounds like a big deal for us. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a heck of a lot more money in CalPERS and in New York State. Um, and uh, CalPERS is the California uh, uh, employees plan. Um, uh, you know, uh, 
So we do it through managers, and we're trying to do it in a cost-effective way, but recognizing that we can move the managers on the issues, and secondly, uh, that they're in it to make sure that they, they get uh, uh, companies that have value to them. And, uh, you know, it's as simple as that. So pension funds want to buy green. They're going to be investing in green. Mm -hmm. And as we move forward, I mean, at what point, I mean, I assume somewhere in the commingled funds, mm -hmm. we've got some investments in something. In well, that's on or whatever you might, might have there. Yeah. I guess what I would say is that nothing's going to change overnight. And there was a thesis in here that, uh, well, these companies that's a core business, they're not going to change. Uh, Take a look at the telecommunications industry. I remember back when I, you know, Ma Bell, and I remember looking back at, uh, at the way those companies had to transform themselves. Some companies will fail, and our managers are looking at that and, making, and looking at what they're doing in response to a changing economy and changing environmental part of that as the economy as well. They're looking at that. And uh, some companies are gonna transform themselves. The investment managers are looking at those at those those issues as they're making investment decisions. I mean, I'm watching the ads again. Yeah. Their ads for mobile. Yep. Yeah. But they're investigating mm -hmm. algae yeah. as fuel. Yeah. I don't have that money. Yeah. They do, but I'm thinking. Yeah. You know, Detroit is investing in electric vehicles. So if mm -hmm. they want to survive. Yep. And we're telling them what it's going to take to survive. Yep. They'll and um, in fairness some to environmental will activists, some of them will die. Yeah. In fairness to environment, and, and with the risk of um, uh, irritating some folks, when I look at the amount of money that um, Exxon is putting into those, I'm not impressed. Okay. okay. On the other they hand, said there were ads. Yep. Yeah, uh, on the other hand, when I look at Total SA that are doing solar, they're doing some other technology that I can't begin to understand, um, they're making some changes. Some companies are going to change themselves, other companies are going to be forced to change. The reality is our investment managers are putting all of that into the factor analysis when they make investment decisions. And we have to, um, uh, we're going to continue to keep the, 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 the button pressed on these issues and, um, um, you know, and, and, and work with them. Our next step will be to develop some metrics. How is, is our pension changing? Um, and, and how do we measure that? And um, so I've invited that in. That would probably be helpful. Yeah, for us. so I've invited in uh, Clean Yield, VPIC, um, excuse me, VPIRG, and uh, Sierra Club to work with us to come up with some metrics on that. Okay, that would be helpful. Yeah. All right. You know, the, the, the trick is that, like we we give we support farmers in mm -hmm. Vermont. We give them millions of dollars of tax breaks and all mm -hmm. sorts of incentives and blah blah blah. And we are now recognizing, and I I do not fault farmers. They live in a mm -hmm. system that has created a lot of phosphorus runoff. And we are now spending millions of dollars to clean it up. Mm -hmm. There is the good senator from Orange has has noted that we would be better to uh, clean us, uh, the practice of upstream rather than pay for costly treatment downstream, sure. or in yep. the health personal health, fix your diet and exercise rather than pay for costly mm -hmm. treatment. Yep. Right. The problem with us investing in fossil fuels as a state with our modest but for us a massive investment in fossil fuels and then struggling to continue to pay for irene and, and mm -hmm. rebuild roads and deal with the health impacts of climate change and on and on we can't just pretend that the fossil fuel industry is just something you got to invest in and and they're they're just sort of your average business i mean this is this is really a problem and i don't mean to suggest for a second that our divesting changes the uh, the practice of it, but to the extent that there is a slow and building worldwide campaign to recognize that we come up with millions and millions of dollars needed to mitigate the impact of climate change and try to stem the emergency, there does seem to be an irreparable uh, conflict in, in 
just sort of accepting the status quo in terms of where her investments are. I don't think we've accepted the status quo, number one. Uh, but secondly, uh, I would also argue that if it costs more money, millions more, and again, we don't, I don't have a direct number uh, for the moment, uh, but if putting more millions into the pension because, uh, because we made that decision means that you have less money for renewable energy. You have less money for energy efficiency. You have less money for, for farmers and mitigation. And you know, I don't think that that's the answer. Um, I think the answer is to continue to work the hard process to, to, to move investment managers and their, 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 their component companies toward a more carbon, uh, uh, a, a carbon, a low carbon economy, excuse me. And I think that that's the type of work we're trying to do. And I think that uh, we're trying to be responsible to our environment. We're trying to be responsible to the taxpayer. And we're trying to be responsible for the, for this, for the, the thousands of employees, vested employees, and, yeah. and, and pension members of the pension system. And that, uh, that's a tough act to balance. And I think that VPIC, uh, again, not the treasurer, but VPIC has done a remarkably good job in, in doing that. And we will continue to find ways, for instance, working on the metrics um, to, um, um, to, to, to move further in that direction um, and make recommendations to the VPIC. It's up to the VPIC to, to whether or not they're going to accept those recommendations, but we're working on it. Okay. I'm having a difficulty with the, we have massive investments mm -hmm. in fuel, mm -hmm. carbon fuel companies. I thought I heard you say, our investments are in these co-mingled mutual mm -hmm. fund things. Index funds. That's the word I was searching for. Okay, okay. index Sorry. funds. And we are not really sure how much money is in any one. I mean, we have the pension fund is massive for us as a whole. But the pension fund as a whole isn't invested in carbon fuel. Do we know? Precisely. So we're trying to develop some changes in the metrics for that reason. Um, so one of the things that they use is um, GICS, which is a classification for investments. And when you look at it, it's got a mixed bag of things that uh, you know that, that we wouldn't consider clean energy as well as clean energy. So when we ask the managers to try to, to, to tell us what their percentages on those, we had a hard time with the classifications on, on, on those. So we're working to try to fix that and get a better handle on that so we can move appropriately and advocate appropriately. Again, a manager makes the decision, but one of the questions we would have is, um, is, is, is ESG really important to you? And if it is, what are you doing? Because we're not seeing progress, uh, or is it just a marketing scheme? And we don't want marketing schemes, we want real investment. Um, in, in, in those values and working that. So we're working on some metrics now and also trying to clean up what's what in the portfolio okay. and looking at that. So we don't just buy stock in Mobile, at Mobile Exxon. We do, the staff does not. Um, a neutral fund, a commingled fund may, may. Um, but our direct holdings um, where we actually own it. So we have some separately managed funds right. that have equities, for instance, and I would say we own those securities. Uh, when you do an index fund, uh, you, uh, you do a co-mingled fund, we're buying into the yeah, fund, we're buying into, into, fund. We're buying into the co-mingled fund. I don't know that I know where my IRA is completely invested. Yep. But there is an option for state employees yes. that do not want their, they want a green, and so far, I, I suppose I should ask the people that send me emails if they, in fact, have invested their pension. Oh, not their pension, not their pension. Their, their deferred their, comp, their, their supplemental their, pension money. Okay, yeah. And I would encourage people to do that because when you get to retirement, you're going to want those dollars. Both. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, Sorry. Okay. You know when people pensions. just are relying on one pension without savings and without deferred comp. Uh, or some other apps, uh, thing that's, that's a uh, mistake. But uh, we have a fossil fuel free recommendation, I mean fund, in all of them. It's uh, PAX Global something environmental. I don't have the, the title okay. off the top of my head, but it's there. 
and it's a, and it's there in the 457 program, uh, which is the deferred comp for all employees. Um, uh, and municipal employees can participate. I don't know if legislators can participate. I'll have to ask. Um, uh, you're I think telling the me only no. the, uh, for our massive compensation, mm -hmm. I think we can defer it. Well, there you go. Okay, uh, for your and the, However, and the, and I'm not the, sure how I buy yeah. groceries. And yeah, because we got a the, notice uh, the other day. Yeah, and the Go great offices you have and the staff to support you. You know, it's impressive. But um, um, and it's in the de deferred, I mean, defined contribution plan, mm -hmm. and it's also in this what's called a 403B, which is essentially a deferred comp for uh, for teachers. Okay. So, so they do have that option. Yeah. Becca. And it's not it hasn't had a great pickup so far. I'm hoping yeah. it does, to be honest. I, I really hope, hope it does. I would hope that all the folks <coughs> that are writing us emails have well, it is a separate first, question, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it is a separate extra, question. Extra but you can you put can your money it. where your mouth is, that's your choice, and then there is a fiduciary so, response. But they might not have money. I mean that's the thing. Yeah, they do. Uh, they're state employees. Are, are there, Right. But Each. but the pickup so in that fund is less than. Um, I'll be very honest. The pickup of that fund uh, has been somewhat disappointing. I'd like to see more money in the fossil fuel free. To be very candid, um, and so far the pickup um, by people making their personal choices has not been o overwhelming. Okay. So forgive my ignorance. I'm trying to think of I don't think that that's committee. ever a word well, that I would use well, with you there's a or lot any of member of this committee. I'm still coming up to speed on. Yep. But so, some years ago, um, when we were all thinking about this individually, mm -hmm. I looked at the money I had invested mm -hmm. um, in an index fund mm -hmm. and realized I wanted to go to a different mm -hmm. index manager that was only investing in you know, clean mm -hmm. stocks, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is there not a possibility for us to be using a different manager that could be investing in a different index fund. So it's sure. a simple, simple question, just want to understand yeah. so that. We so we did is. a couple of things. We, um, um, we, we, when we look at an index manager, yeah. we've looked at their, their ESG response as well. Okay. Uh, we've got a lot uh, with um, BlackRock, which just joined the UN PRI. It's got its problems. I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't. Okay. We're working on that. Uh, but we're having conversations with them. One of the funds that we just did recently was an agricultural f fund um, that actually is doing um, things to try to lower um, uh, phosphorus, uh, lower um, um, use of insecticides and things along that line, some new technologies. And we think that's a great place to be because we think those new technologies are going to be very important in the future. So we've done that. Uh, we also uh, have a farmland piece that has a zero deforestation policy. Uh, so we're trying to, and, and the fact of the matter is that I, I'm saying those things because we looked at those things. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as a member of the board, or I keep saying board, but it is a committee, the right. Pension Investment Committee, as a member of the committee, um, I looked at those things, and obviously the rest of the committee did because we selected those managers. Okay. okay. Don't you know, BlackRock okay. had its problems. It's now starting to to hear the voice and uh, of, of of folks on these issues, and we're trying to continue to have the ability to to push that. And again, I can't understand why there's an effort in 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 a Republican con uh, uh, Congress, and I apologize to the members here. Um, that to push an issue to lower our ability to have our voice in proxies if it wasn't being effective. You know, why would they care? They'd say, it's ineffective anyways, let it go. They're now seeing that we're making progress. I, I don't contend that, it's ineff that it has zero effect. I, I contend that the goal is not to make fossil fuel industry better corporate citizens. It's to stop extracting fossil fuel, and I think that it's think a very large stretch to suggest that we can, you know, petition them to that. Yeah, I don't believe the divestment is going to accomplish that, though. You have seen some <coughs> level of success in coal, and they themselves credit divestment. I, I don't, I don't mean to say that it's the whole thing, not at all. But even BlackRock's divested from coal. I mean. Mm -hmm. We, it's distressing to me that we're not sure if we're invested in coal. Uh, well, I don't believe we have any direct investments in coal. 
Uh, I'd have to yeah. look further. Sure. Okay. Well, there's a separate yeah. question there. But. Okay. Yeah. I think. Well, it's always in an index fund, for example. Yeah, most of, I get it. But most of the index the funds are crowding it out because it's, exactly yeah, because all. like the Russell 2000, things like that, because of the size and capitalization, they're pretty much out of it. And we predicted that that would happen um, back uh, a few years ago, and in fact, um, it happened faster than we thought. Whether this, I, I can't say for certainty, but you know, the market is moving in that direction to push coal out of the index funds. Mm -hmm. But out of the index fund notwithstanding, we're using coal. Right now, this building, 3% of it is being heated by coal as we speak. Uh, I think there's a lot of ways to look at our own behavior and try to make okay. improvements. I would that, agree. That, that's the argument. I, mean, I would agree. Okay. It's just about 5 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And the weather is not getting better. So thank you. My pleasure. Um, and we'll see where it goes. Yeah. Okay. But keep moving in the direction you're going in. Appreciate that. Thank you. If, How is our, uh, our, what is it, the little, uh, the thing I can't wait to invest in for my own retirement, the, the, uh, the pension, the public pension kind of idea, where's that at? Ah, the, um, oh, Green Mountain Secure Retirement. Oh, yeah, yeah. We expect yeah. to have that up in well, June. We've here. selected a vendor. And uh, we're in the, the, the horrible process of contract negotiations, um, which are no, not a lot of fun, but we hope to have it up in, in June. As you know, we had a little bit of a speed bump with the Department of Labor at the federal level, not here. And that's been resolved. And we're moving forward. And we've got companies that are following us looking for the opportunity to do it. So we're really enthusiastic. In June, okay, I'll watch for the release. And you got it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this just a bit. Hold up, it's because.